and like my first thought was like you're fired like you're done that like i don't know why my brain just goes there like worst case scenario but i was like you're done that's mm-hmm. it dude that's a career ender like your number one qualifier leading the points whatever the kid like and you just ruined it like for specialized for aaron for everybody championship gone like thanks for playing a big shout out goes to jensen usa max's tires for supporting the inside line welcome mountain bikers Here, i saw a red button we're always recording <laughs> hot mics, mics everywhere hot. on this course what did you call this again inside line ride along. the inside yeah. line ride along yeah episode two again with team robot charlie sponsel john hall of intense factory racing yes sir and johnny simonetti and i'm jason schroeder all right question number one straight into it like yeah, just straight into boom it. <laughs> we are a lot more organized than last time <laughs> i only have uh, one Rip question planned for the night so question <laughs> okay. number one going to next year we have some format changes at the world cup so as a mechanic what is your thoughts on having basically three race runs now does that add any more stress to your life yes um i don't know i don't want to give the stock answer that everybody's given on about all the changes and stuff but it's hard to say without having gone through one yet or doing it yet so Mm -hmm. we'll find out i can speculate on how it's going to go i know how race days can go Mm -hmm. in the current format um and there have been times and moments where you have a uh, rider goes up for the first run, everything's all good. And you're kind of, sometimes you go on cruise control. You're like, all right, all good. We'll start prepping for race, like do your little things. And then he comes down and it's like, you've had an explosion. If they've qualified well and are dropping late, it's okay because you have time now. But if they, if you have a rider who's maybe farther back in the rankings mm-hmm. and your race runs earlier and they blow a bike up, like it's all hands on deck, motor swap, you know, mode, like get it done. And so now that just kind of puts all of us in that position. It doesn't really matter mm-hmm. if you've got two race runs and your rider grenades on the first run and snaps a frame. Like we saw Greg do, mm-hmm. um, Val sold that one year, like, and they got it done, like teamwork and everything, but that's going to happen. Like there's going to be some dramas and there's going to be some tight stuff that, most people probably won't see, you know, you don't mm-hmm. see that stuff behind the scenes. You'll hear about it in the media or something afterwards or something like that. But yeah, we're just gonna have to see. Um, hopefully everything goes good and smooth, but yeah, there's definitely, even if a flat tire and a run and you know, you're a mechanic, you're at the top and your rider has a mechanical, no matter what it is, you're gonna have to make a decision of, um, and I don't know what those time frames are yet. So I don't know if it's going to be a rush to like get back down the hill, make the fix, and then get back up Mm -hmm. or if there's going to be plenty of time, you know, excuse me, if there's going to be a couple hours before their next race run. Okay. Then no worries. You know, even if there's a incident, then it's fine. We'll just get down the hill, assess it and hammer away and, and get back up the hill. But the thing is, is like, there's other things to consider. Um, like the riders warm up. So I'm super curious about that kind of stuff of hmm. just what that time frame is going to be between those two race runs mm-hmm. on race day, um, from the semi qual or the semi final and the final. And so if it's if it's like in the two hour range, that's going to be a funky time to get right um, because I'll just I just know my routine and our routine is I, I like to be at the top for race run roughly an hour early or at least leaving the pit an hour early and athletes warm up depending on who they are will be somewhere around 20 to 30 minutes. And so Aaron doesn't like to stand around or waste any time. So he's like scares the crap out of me and gets up there <laughs> like 30 minutes before his race run. <laughs> but you're getting up there way before, way Aaron before. Goes. Okay. Yeah. Way before. Cause I want everything set so he can just step in and do his thing. Mm-hmm. I don't want him standing around watching me set the trainer up, fumble with a wheel, <laughs> freaking trip on over my bag and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So like, I like to get up there first. It's funny. Cause we kind of like not battle, but like he likes to go up together and I like to go up early on my own and like, not because I want to be on my own, but because like, I need to get up there early, set the bike up, 
sometimes I know that warm up space is important. Well, it's always important, but it's like could be limited. Mm -hmm. If there's weather and you need to find some shelter, like you want to get up there as early as possible so that you're the one standing around waiting for an earlier rider trainer to get out of the way so you can swoop a good spot. And then you might, I've stood up there for like an hour and a half to two hours before in crappy weather just to be able to get a good spot so that he can roll in 30 minutes, 40 minutes early or like till his run and have a covered sheltered area away from the wind or the rain. Hmm. So like there's all these factors as a mechanic that I have, I think about, I don't know if you have to think about it. It's just what I do. Yeah. So, I mean, if time out, I'm going to get in here and ask one question. <laughs> Do other mechanics do that? Or are you the only one waiting for a parking spot? Spomer, you don't have a microphone? <laughs> Buttons uh, are tight. <laughs> what a servant leader. We are, right? dude. Homie's running the podcast. but doesn't love even... it. He's in the background. He's all part money. of it. He's, he's like, like, you guys have all the fun. He's like yeah. our own Jamie. Parking spot? He's like mm -hmm. our own Jamie. Yeah. He just chimes in when he needs to. Are you even in the frame? No. Okay. Yeah, yeah. background. Well, for all our viewers, uh, Sean Spomer's hanging out over there. The, <laughs> I just want to know if John Hall waits for a parking spot, like if, if other mechanics do. <laughs> <laughs> so funny thing about that. Um, I hope, uh, I hope, uh, Aaron Pelletari is listening. Troy Brosnan's mechanic. I would say it is a unwritten rule between mechanics up there. So, and I don't know if everybody knows this rule or if I just made it up in my head and I think it's an unwritten rule and <laughs> You're I'm, making I'm, rule. I'm the only one following this rule. <laughs> um, so, but Aaron Pelletari and I, when we were on specialized together, we always kind of had a deal. Like, um, we never battled over anything or anything like that, but it was like the warm up spot that you used on qualifying day. Uh -huh. That was your warm up spot for race day. So it was like almost for track walk, like up as a mechanic, like you get to the top and guys are like hurrying to the start hut. And as a mechanic, I'm like looking around, I'm like, <laughs> all right, if it's hot and sunny, where's the shady spot? If it's windy, what's going to block the most wind wow, coming from level. every direction? Wait, wait, wait. And what time of day is qualifying? Uh, usually early afternoon, like mm -hmm. just after lunch. So, so it starts around one, but our guys will usually be off between like two and two thirty ish. So that's a little earlier. This is such a great question, by the way, Spomer, like what are the politics of so, warm up spots up top? That, that's the other thing too, is like track walk is supposed to start <laughs> at like noon or one o'clock. Mm -hmm. So you're pretty close to like when you're going to be qualifying. So weather wise, you can kind of not bank on it, but because it's weather, but, but you're also probably getting out the sundial and trying to figure out where you're going to be at four <laughs> on three or four. On I'm Sunday. not that crazy, but dude, there are mechanics out there. Like Nigel Reeve, like he's, he spent a lot of time in, in Europe and he's very familiar with a lot of these mountains and what time the storms roll in and from what direction and like has these crazy weather apps and <laughs> all this kind of stuff where it's like, I learned a lot of this stuff from them and just like listening to him too. And so, dude, I'm up there like spotting stuff and maybe it's just me going into that kind of detail, but I think about all that kind of stuff. And then track walk, I'm just like, I'm just making notes of what the mm. conditions are. I'm not helping with line choice. I'm not, I'm just looking for points of reference for if he comes down in a run is like in this section, the bike feels like this and I can visualize that section um, or at least take that information to Jordy or somebody at Fox and, and get a recommendation or something like that but um anyways going back it's so it's like yeah whatever spot you would get on qualifying day is typically what you would get on race day so then uh when when we went our separate ways on different teams before we went to canyon i think at the time we went to yt or whatever and they were still on specialized where was it um leo gang so i have a spot at leo gang it's not a, it's not a secret. It's not hidden. And the last couple of years have been weird because of the pandemic stuff mm -hmm. and they don't allow us in this area anymore, but I've tried to like sneak in there and just ask for <laughs> forgiveness. And it's not like a cordoned off area or anything like that. It's like this little like children's playground area, mm -hmm. but there's an old a lift house and it's like on top of the lift house and there's an office up there and it has this overhang, but it's completely level. Like if it's hot, it will always be shaded. If it's raining, it will be covered. And if it's windy, it's blocked from like two directions. So it's like the most, and it's, Dude. and there's just enough room for one trainer. And then like <laughs> there's steps and a ramp so you can get some like elevated push ups. If you have like a, what are those little like bungee ropes that they like to like stretch their mm -hmm. shoulders and stuff with, there's like a fence you can tie that to. There's a good tree that you can walk behind and pee like in private. 
and stuff like that for like all the pre-race peas so and jitters movies. and stuff like that. There's all this stuff that like I think about. <laughs> it's easy now because we've been doing it for like 10 years. So like I just have these spots. It just kind of comes automatic. But it's like this is all the stuff that I think about. Anyways, one year I showed up at qualifying like this is just my spot. And like Pelotari knows this was my spot, dude. <laughs> and I can't remember if it was qualifying day or if I had it on qualifying day and it was race day and I showed up. And like they qualified, I think we qualified a little bit better. So we're up there later. And so like Pelotari mm-hmm. and Troy were up there before us. In your spot. And dude, I'm like pumped. Like I got headphones. I don't think I had headphones in, but it's like kind of jamming <laughs> in your head. It's like, it's going to be a great day. The weather's good. It's Leo gang. Like Secret the spot. views are beautiful. <laughs> I'm like headed to my spot. Did I come up and I round the corner and I look and there's Troy on the trainer, like just that shit eating grin that he has and Peltari <laughs> dude standing there and Troy just starts laughing because he knew the deal. And then like Pel- I just leave the, the look on my face just had to been like, what the heck, dude? <laughs> and Peltari just goes, I'm so sorry, man. Like our spot was taken. I had, we were rushing. Like I had to get him on the bike. Like I wasn't up here the summer. <laughs> and I was just like, I couldn't even react or say anything. I was like, I can't believe you did this. And like, <laughs> it's all in fun. Like it wasn't actually like serious. I'm not like legit pissed or anything. But like to this day, like I was just looked at him. I was like, you know the deal, dude. Like <laughs> you now owe me a spot. Like <laughs> if I see you in an ideal spot, like, I'm taking it. <laughs> like, I'm going to... You're calling back that favor. I'm yeah. going to repo your spot. And like, no questions asked. You know the rules. <laughs> like, I've never cashed in on that. It's just like a joke that we keep... What happened when you least expect it? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> That's no. incredible. And I would like never actually ever do that. Yeah. But I did. We joke with each other about it and stuff like that. But to this day, it's like, I'll see a spot and be like, oh, kind of like that spot. And he just laughs and shakes his head. <laughs> like, I don't know, I might come back for it tomorrow. <laughs> So, um, yeah, that's kind of the stuff that we think about as mechanics, I guess. Up there. It's like our race run. <laughs> yeah. So uh, going back to your question of like the new schedule and uh-huh. all that kind of stuff. So it's going to be interesting what the time frame is you have to accomplish all of this. Mm-hmm. If it's going to be, we're for sure going to be getting up there for the first run and probably just leaving the trainer mm-hmm. in the spot that you set up and whether or not you have to go back down or have time to, or if you're going to wait at the top for your rider, um, your start time's probably going to change from semis to finals, depending on where you finish. So mm-hmm. then you have to think about that. You may have more or less time based off of that. Um, hmm. yeah, I don't know. Just honestly, we're going to have to get there and find out. You it's going to be guys, interesting. I think you might potentially have a backup bike. Do you guys already do that at all? <sighs> yeah. Um, I'm sure you have so spares, obviously. For sure. We have like, spares. Yeah. It's harder for the phase of development we're in right now, yeah. but with this much time and planning, like 100%, all the top teams are going to have two bikes. Yeah. Like you'd almost be silly not to, like you have to consider it plus spares. Mm-hmm. Um, Wait, in, so do you have, do you, you haven't had that just with where you guys are? We've with had it in bikes? the past okay. on teams mm-hmm. for sure. But recently with the bikes and just how we've been developing, we haven't. Gotcha. Had a need to. Yeah. But um, when you say two bikes, you mean two complete <clears throat> bikes ready to rock. Race bikes. So when yeah. stuff goes down, you're like, mm-hmm. okay, and get the Yeah, when stuff out. goes down, like it literally might be just like from the bike that they grenade, like you just you're just pulling suspension off because mm-hmm. that's your race suspension and you probably have some dummy suspension. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not dummy suspension, just like bone out of stock. A stock out of box suspension on your spare bike. Mm-hmm. And so when you come down, it might just be okay, like a fire drill to swap your fork and your shock yeah. rather than a fire drill to like swap a frame hmm. type of situation. So these are all the things I think about too, like um, like developing bikes and mainly this one with intense and keeping in consumers in mind of like when we talk about like external routing and it's like, oh, it could be cleaner like this. I'm like, yeah, but if you do it like that in a race situation, it's going to trip me up selfishly mm-hmm. is what mm-hmm. i think about in the end like it should be great like if it's good for the race bike and working quickly or swapping a part out like mm-hmm. it will be good for the customer as well mm-hmm. so like we try to like really push that kind of stuff which is why like our race bikes are externally routed um easier on aluminum bikes obviously a little bit mm-hmm. better um making sure that you know externally routing isn't always uh the best 
you have to think about like, okay, once I do snap all these zip ties off, do I have to take the shock out to fit the caliper back through the frame? Is it on the outside or the inside of that? Like that kind of stuff. Like, oh, no, the shock can stay in and the caliper can slide through. Like, can I get the brake lever you know, through, brake lever through <clears throat> the triple clamps, like yeah. slide it through and that kind of stuff. Like hmm. how quickly can I do um, fire drills yeah. in, in all these situations? And then how does that apply to like a production bike? Yeah. And the end consumer. So do you, do you practice these fire drills in the off season? Absolutely not. <laughs> no. Do you guys know, uh, major pain with Damon Wayne's? Yeah. You know, it's like cleaning the Glock blindfolded from you know, hanging upside down. I'm just picturing John just doing a shock overall blindfolded. Yeah. No, I don't get that serious. Sometimes you just get those situations. Like you try to work those bugs out like nationals, like that stuff will happen. Mm -hmm nationals are almost just important for teams and mechanics as world cups are like you don't want the first world cup to be the first race you've done that year mm -hmm. like it's really good to get out to nationals and like work out some bugs and like oh yeah like go even going through setting the bike up for the day and you know getting to the track before everybody else so that you know in my opinion my existence is there to make their lives as easy as possible or their mechanics sh existence should be that mm -hmm. so that you put them in the best mindset and or space as possible so that ideally they should just be able to walk in like in if they wanted to be fully kitted and just grab their bike and go like air pressure set tire pressure set suspension set for the day bikes anything you know repaired from the day before fresh clean whatever it doesn't always mean like they were not especially today like we're not rebuilding bikes overnight and staying up till two o'clock in the morning every night like it mm -hmm. just doesn't happen nor do I like allow that to happen. Like <laughs> they're like my general rules, like try to be home for dinner. Like mm -hmm. now granted there are some things that need to be done and dinner can wait for me personally. Um, I will always stay and get work done, but you don't want to be there all night. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not fun. So, um, yeah, everything we try to do is, is to make life as easy and as seamless as possible at a race. Cause there's already enough chaos for an athlete at a race and like the mindset and, getting back and forth from the track and the times that they do and training and the fans and signings and like all this kind of stuff. Like the last thing you want to do is like, did my mechanic check my air pressure? Like my tires good. Like I need a new rear tire today. And you didn't put like, like all that kind of stuff. Like you don't want to like, here's your bike. So how many runs on tires before they're out? It's not runs. It's like days uh -huh. um, or like what days it is. So hmm. our general, rule, everybody's always different, but I can, pretty confidently say probably like protocols pretty much the same across most factory teams so day one practice like fresh tires front and rear no matter what um this is a little harder with mixed wheel size and both wheel sizes are the same it was a good rotation but with um so the we'll go through first day of practice with fresh set of tires um the rear is usually cooked by the end of the day if it's not it's depending on the track if it's not that rough they can last a little bit longer <clears throat> When you say cooked, do you mean like, wow, that tire looks annihilated? Or do you mean I can start to see a... By World Cup standards. I would say cooked. by World Cup standards. Would um, you run it personally? 100%. Okay. Yes. <laughs> As a front tire too? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. At least for like a little bit. All right. So, and it depends too. It's like some tracks are like real chunky and they'll chew tires up. No legit. Like, you yeah, know, yeah. Like you don't want to run this tire. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, most people would be like, heck yeah, free tire. I'll still run that thing. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Have at it. Um, so we'll do fresh set first day. Um, and then depending on, we may do qualifying the next day and some, I'll just interject real quick. Some riders have their own like little protocols that they prefer. Dakota is one of them, which is what popped in my mind. But for Aaron, um, sometimes we've ran qualifying practice and qualifying on this first set of tires that we set on the first day of practice, if they're still good. And then just a new set for race day. Mm -hmm. So Dakota I might get this a little bit wrong, but so he'll run a fresh set for practice. And then <clears throat> on, I think qualifying day, he will put a fresh set on again and do his like first practice run on it, <clears throat> but then go back to his original set and then do his, the rest of practice. So usually like a second run and then qualifying on that. And then he will do his, 
maybe it's race day. He does it either way. Like he doesn't want to do a race run on a brand new, fresh set of tires. He wants like one, he wants like one or two runs on them by the time he goes to put like a, a run down for both qualifying and race day. Hmm. So while he's practicing, he will come down and it might be like a separate wheel set set up ready for him. And he'll throw on a new set, do a run, take them off. And then that's like qualifying set. And then like, here's my race set. So, and hmm. then at the end of the day, like after a race, like those tires are fresh for a race day, no matter what, if the co's done that or if it's Aaron. And then those, those tires stay on the bike. Hmm. Usually until like, if we have a next following round, like those tires will be first day practice tires, even though they have a couple runs on mm-hmm. them, two, three runs, like they will be first practice day. Hmm. Um, when we have, when we had bikes where both wheels were the same size, it was a lot easier because you'd run fresh set on practice day. And then I would just put the front tire on the rear and the mm. new front tire for qualifying day. And then one fresh set front and rear for race day. So like on any given weekend per rider, like you're really only going through like two to three tires barring any flats or like incidents or anything like that. So hmm. it's not like as wasteful as people think. And then we always try to like make sure that we hand these tires out to like kids or fans or like just set them outside for somebody to come mm-hmm. and grab and recycle and, run them till they're done so Mm. yeah interesting yeah yeah and just in case you haven't wrapped your head around this we're interviewing the john hall right now so (laughs) i don't know if our like introduction for this podcast is quite sufficient yeah i'm still sitting over here just like oh my goodness but that's john hall (laughs) jason was the one that did the intro and if for those of you don't know jason was like one of the first riders i ever like actually wrenched for on Rich Hausman's mm-hmm. program. I don't know, hope you guys talked about that a little bit. We really didn't. Rich's podcast was about Rich. Yeah, yeah. I intervened a little bit about That's where him good. and I overlapped. But um, I before you got here, Spomer was like, do you know John at all? <laughs> and I was like, funny enough, a long bef- time ago. before he wrenched for Aaron, he wrenched for Charlie and I on, on Rich's team. Yeah. So which Rich- is funny because I remember going to the bike shop you were at. Yeah. And you were like working on our bikes and stuff. Right. Like on the clock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was like, this is so cool. We have a mechanic. This yeah. is crazy. Do yeah. you remember at National Champs, you bled our rear brakes through our number plates? You oh, did that yeah. one time. Yep. Just to make them look good. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. Like didn't cut a slit to like a hole. Like <laughs> took the lever off, <laughs> put the line through, <clears throat> bled it through. Yeah. Yeah, That's we amazing. had to look good. I don't I know why I did that or where I why I wanted to do that. <laughs> I felt bad because I cut it off. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, was I, was like, I don't know how to bleed this back there. That was me? the last time you did that. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> probably. Yeah, like, I do remember I it was. I might have been National Champs or Angel Fire, but uh-huh. uh, Shane Leslie blew his rear wheel up. Like la- it was like my first looking back on now in hindsight is my first like real fire drill, and like Shane blew his rear wheel up grenaded full catastrophic spokes everywhere wheel tire everything done Mm -hmm. and he came rolling down and it was like rich just looked at me he's like you have to get it ready for race run (laughs) and he's like he's leaving in like 25 minutes and i was like okay (laughs) and just like went to i was like i don't know where to start in this situation obviously you know what to do like everything needs to come off and everything new needs to go on but it was like it's not just a wheel wheel chain derailleur shift cables been ripped out like ev- like everything Perfect. very <laughs> shane leslie and then it was like this that was like my, my kind of Love like you, baptism shane. by fire where like this has to be perfect and then he's going to go up and do a race run and try to win and like with no practice and everything has to feel the same like okay here you go on, in a sense it was like a great practice for me on these guys even shane's first race with the team was sea otter Mm-hmm. And he showed up with a different bike and we had a frame for him. And Richards was like, Oh, John will just build it for you when you get here. And he showed up like an hour, maybe two before <laughs> downhill practice. And it was like, here's my old bike. And I had to build him his race bike for sea otter practice. And it had to be done in two hours. <laughs> I was like, okay. Like I thought I had more time to do this. Like <laughs> you just exactly have no choice. Like it's those situations though. that like, it physically puts your back up against the wall. You just have no choice. There's no other option. There's nobody there to help you. There's nobody you can ask for anything. Mm -hmm. It's just, this is what I have. And this is what I have to do. Go. And hopefully it all works out. And it was literally like, he's like, I need to be, I think the first shuttle had already left. And like second shuttle was lining up. And I was like bleeding his rear brake. Like, (laughs) 
<laughs> it's just like you're gonna be going fast. Hope yeah. this is okay, dude. I hope it's I didn't Seattle, contaminate survive. your pads. Like, yeah. yeah. But at the time, I was like, it was very serious for me. I'm like, yeah, totally. Sea Otter, this is huge, dude. Like, yeah. first big race. ODI paid for my hotel room. Like, I still wasn't getting dude. paid for anything, or maybe Rich just paid for it. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> he told me ODI paid for it. <laughs> um, yeah, it was. I loved those days. Those were fun. It was full of, like baptism by fire. You try to take care of like, and again, this is hindsight, but put Charlie Harrison. Jason Schroeder and Shane Leslie on a team and one mechanic and all three of those guys are juniors <laughs> and go to na- and go to angel fire with them uh, <laughs> for national champs. And then be like, you have two spare wheel sets and like four tires for all these kids. Like <laughs> that's pretty much what it was. And, and we want all of them on the podium. <laughs> hope, yeah. hope you're good with a spoke wrench. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it was just like, Holy crap. But like, I'm, again, like looking back, you're like, Oh, those days were awesome. Yeah. So that makes some of the days I've done look pretty easy. Shoot, yeah. Because wasn't it the following year that you got linked up with Aaron? Or was there... Or maybe there was like another year with wrenching for Rich's team or so, but... Yeah. I mean, it was pretty quick. It was fast. It yeah. was 2013. And you guys... It was still the Trek ODI um, satellite team. Yeah. And there's special With like John that. Buckle and all those yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then buckle was helping doing the wrenching and racing mm-hmm. i think logan mulali was on it as he well. was yeah yeah. yeah yeah he totally was oh this is flashing back now jeez um some names in there yeah some big names in there and so yeah it was 2013 and it was right around the transition to specialize i remember getting the word of what was happening when aaron was going to specialize and mm-hmm. all the drama behind the scenes and rich kind of filled me in and he was like hey by the way um like you Aaron and me are like the only ones that know this right now. Like you cannot say a word to anybody, you know? And I was just like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> this is a lot of pressure. <laughs> You're like, who do I like, tell first? Aaron, I was like, Aaron God. Gwynn's going to specialize and everybody thinks he's on track right now. I was mm-hmm. like, what? And so, and then it obviously just went down how it went down and it was all good. But, um, so that's roughly right around when I met, Aaron, I want to say sometime in 2013, like obviously like through you guys, Mm -hmm. he was coaching you guys and riding just kind of randomly, but it was early end of 13, early 14 that I like first ranch for him. Okay. Fontana. And you guys were out at Fontana with Uh him. And then I was wrenching for you guys. Uh And then Rich was like, Hey, Aaron's going to be here. Can you take care of him too? But he was fine. He was just like pedaled his own practice laps, like came in how he still does it to this day, like shows up pulls his bike out, like pedals to the top, does laps by himself or, you know, with other people, but doesn't mm-hmm. get on the shuttle and then goes home for the day. And then I worked on his bike that night and the, I was so nervous, dude. Like <laughs> a blue S works. Yes. Yeah. That's what it was. Is that yeah, blue and black yeah. carbon yeah. S works was like, and I remember I was in the garage. Rich is just like, yeah, just take it home. Just go over it real quick. Just like, <laughs> just like what well, you do the kids <laughs> yeah, bike. Make sure. sure it's I was like, yeah, yeah, cool, cool. No problem. I got that. Yeah. Toss it in the truck. <laughs> and I came home and like I was roommates with Chappie Feeney. Mm-hmm. That's right. And I was just like, I walked in the garage and he was like, are you kidding? I was rolling this bike. And I was like, he's like, what are you doing with that? I'm like, I got to prep it tonight. He's like, what? <laughs> I was like, he's like, what do you got to do? I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> Rich, gonna look at it. Just... <laughs> Rich just said, make sure it's good for tomorrow. So I just check some bolts. And like, but I remember his front brake was rubbing a little bit and it had those, uh, those old codes and with like the conical washers. Yeah. And they had been like, uh, not over tightened, but like when you tighten them down in the same spot a few times, like they just find their mm-hmm. old home and like, it doesn't matter what you do to those things, dude. Like your brakes rubbing. That's where it's is. Like, just live with it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is unacceptable. <laughs> <laughs> I can't possibly go home with Aaron Gwynn's bike with the, <laughs> with the expectations of prepping it for a race and the front rotors rubbing. <laughs> not on my ask, watch. ask Chappie, dude. I think I was up till like 11 o'clock at night just trying to adjust the front brake so that the rotor didn't rub. And like, I was like, I can't touch the rotor. It was like sacrilegious of like, I don't want the oil from my skin contaminating mm. it. Like I didn't know that I could grab a paper towel and just like bend it over real quick. Like less than a second, <laughs> I would have been out of like Bob's your <laughs> uncle, dude. And I'm sitting there trying to get daylight on both sides of this caliper <laughs> for hours dude and i i couldn't tell you if i actually finished or I, like accomplished it or not like uh, to, that's just all i remember i was like i have to get some sleep dude i have to be at font down in the morning like that's incredible yeah so we did that and then we went to bootleg the next weekend with just it was me aaron and charlie mm-hmm. and then well, that's hold up, hold up did you get it 
I, that's what I don't remember. Truly. I was like, <laughs> I probably was like, I think it's just going to be good. like, that's the way it was when he gave it to me. Yeah. So obviously like, it's okay it's right. enough. Like, and he that's didn't fun. say anything about it. So with bloodshot yeah. eyes the next morning. Yeah. It's yeah. good to go. Yeah. I think <laughs> I didn't go to bed till four hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so the next, and he, yeah, I'm pretty sure he won that weekend. It was Fontana. But then we went to bootleg the following weekend, just Aaron and Charlie and I, and that was like my first trip with him. And that was so fun, dude. Right. I was like, I'm in the Fox Raptor with the six bikes on the tailgate. We're going to Vegas. Like, this is awesome. And then Rich is just texting me randomly. He's like, hey, like, just kind of do like what you did with this bike, Fontana. Like, just pretend like you're his mechanic. I was like, what? I was like, that's weird. Like, kind of a weird text. Mm-hmm. And you know how Rich, like, Jason knows Rich pretty well. Like, he can be pretty cryptic with what he <laughs> sends and stuff. So it's like, what are you doing? I know you're up to something. I was like, okay. This like, means more. It does mean no. <laughs> more, but I don't know what it is. And I truly had no idea what he was working on. Yeah. And yeah, I think at one point I was doing like, he's like, yeah, just make sure you do like bolt checks between each run, like check their tire pressure each run. I was like, okay. He's like, act like a, like a mechanic just for those guys. I was like, cool. Do that. Try the air and both win. And then uh, we drove home and I th- we were sitting in his kitchen. Got drove home from bootleg, get home like Sunday night. Mm-hmm. We were in his kitchen just kind of, chatting and he goes hey um good job this weekend like thanks for all your help and everything he's like, yeah no problem man probably can get out here he's like yeah one more thing he's like uh you gonna go to world cups with me this year and i, I was just like yep <laughs> <laughs> and he goes cool uh i'll call specialized tomorrow and uh keep you posted i was like all right sweet man thanks and like i just like walked out of his house and like shut the door and i was like what <laughs> just happened <laughs> kind of like thing like is this real? I was like, still didn't even like believe it, expect it. Like, that's wow. really I was like good. driving home. I'm like, I, this is like, I don't know. This feels weird. Like lucid <laughs> dream. Cause it wasn't official yet. Like special. I still had to say, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Come to find out like things have been being worked on in the behind the scenes for some time. Getting Eric Carter in as the manager, John Kniba is the other mechanic. Rich was kind of like doing what Rich does, mm. facilitating things. And, and he knew exactly what he's doing. It was like a, it was a trial run for me, Fontana and bootleg. And I just heard the story from Aaron the other day. We're talking to a guy and he was like, oh, so did you guys like grow up together? Like, around? <laughs> like, no, like, how do you, how'd you guys link up? And Aaron got, he pretty much has the same story, but he's like, yeah, Rich was basically like, Hey, I got this guy. He's helping the juniors out. Like mm-hmm. pretty cool dude. Like, Seems solid, does a great job with these guys. Like, give him a shot because he needed a mechanic. Because JC and those guys, um, specialized brought the team back in house, mm-hmm. and then JC and Sam and those guys all went to Nuke Proof. So they had to like rebuild the whole team structure from inside. So they needed managers, mechanics, like mm-hmm. all everything, and yeah, <clears throat> got thrown in. I talked to, um, talked to the marketing guy, and what was it? uh, Jeff Rogers. Jeff, if you're out there still listening, I'm pretty sure he's still at Specialized. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I had a phone call with him and he was like, well, um, you come at a high recommendation from Aaron Gwynn, Eric Carter, and Rich Hausman. And he's like, you're pretty much the first guy I've ever hired over the phone. <laughs> so I'll send you an email with a plane ticket. You guys are coming up here to Morgan Hill for a team camp. Um, we're handling all of that and I'll have a contract. I was like, Cool. Damn, that's cool. <laughs> Sounds good. And then it was like, I want to say that was February ish, February or March. But you're still full time in a bike shop. That's what I was about to ask. So when I got home from Bullet, literally like that Monday, I had to go into work. I put my two weeks in the next uh-huh. morning. I was like, hey, like, I got to put my two weeks in. And the manager was like, I freaking knew it. Dude. Like, <laughs> I knew you were going to get snatched away. Even like Charlie's mom, too, Susie. She mm-hmm. was like, you're Charlie's mechanic first. <laughs> like, <laughs> how come he gets to steal you and all this kind of stuff like that? And um, so, yeah, yeah, I put my two weeks in that Monday. And then, so the other thing too is I was going to school full time, I was working full time. I literally didn't have any days off. I was working, I had one day off. Um, so I'd work like Monday through Friday and then alternate Fridays and Saturdays, or sorry, Saturdays and Sundays at the bike shop because. Anybody who works at bike shop retail, like you don't get weekends off. Mm-hmm. I was pretty lucky that I had one of the weekend days off. You're typically working through the weekend and have a random weekday off. And then um, I was going to school at night from like 6 p.m. to 10, like four nights a week. So 
like the days that I would work and have school, it was from like eight or nine in the morning till 10 or 11 o'clock at night, like four days a week. And then six days a week of, of all of it and having like one day off. And then on the side, like going to Fontana, helping out all the juniors. Like I look back on it. I was like, holy crap, dude. Like I was just head down at it. Like, yeah. <laughs> it just, I had no life. I didn't go That's out. <laughs> Nothing, dude. Where were you going to school? For? <clears throat> um, so my ultimate plan, I was in like mark general, like marketing and mm. business stuff. And so my ultimate plan, like working at shops and like always reps, that was kind of the time when like reps mm-hmm. would still come into the shop. And I was like, these guys are like pretty cool. Like it would be fun to go to work for like a big brand, like giant or specialized and like just be in the industry, mm-hmm. not at a bike shop. I didn't want to be there forever. It's like I had bigger aspirations than that. And funny enough, um, I don't know if anybody knows John Hornbeck, but he was working at the shop. He's like a domestic pro road racer. Like grew up riding motocross, or, like trained and rode with like Dean Wilson and all mm-hmm. those guys. Kind of your typical amateur story. Like not going to make it. We'll find something mm-hmm. else. He was really good at riding road bikes and training. So he went to be a pro road cyclist and rode for like the Hoggins Berman team. Wow. Um, and was like really, really good. And now he's working for, sorry if my watch is going off. <laughs> um, now he's working for a supplement company called caged, um, who has Colt Nichols on HRC Honda is like his big athlete there. Huh. And then like a bunch of like CrossFit athletes and stuff, but he's previously worked at monster. Anyways, solid resume. Good dude. He knew Aaron kind of from the old moto days. Cause Aaron was in the moto world. Hmm. And actually used to be a wrench there and like, so kind of connected. And one day we were working at the shop and he was just like training and working at the shop, building bikes for extra cash. Hmm. And he's back there and he's like, man, he's like, you really want to be here forever? I was like, what do you mean? Like one of these like back, you know, <laughs> workshop, bike shop <laughs> conversations. I was like, bike shops? I was like, absolutely not. No. He's like, what do you want to do? I was like. I don't know, man, like be pretty sick to just be in the industry, but higher up doing something else. He's like, why don't you go to work for like Aaron Gwynn as a mechanic or something? And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, dude, as uh, awesome as that would be, there are thousands of dudes who are better than I am, who are for sure on his radar before I would ever be considered to be on a list like that. He's like, no way, dude. Absolutely. You could be like, like the dude's just like, he's like, what? Absolutely. No way. Dude, you could totally do that. I was like, you're high. You're crazy. <laughs> and this is probably like one, like six months to a year prior. Like just, I don't even think I was working for the juniors, like mm-hmm. you guys or anything mm-hmm. like that. And it was literally like one year later and I was Aaron Gwynn's mechanic on Factor Specialized going That's to South crazy. Africa. <laughs> and I've, so dude, we've, like, And we're still buddies to this day. And he's yeah. like, we've talked about that. He's like, see, dude, put it out there. Yeah. Like eat you can do literally, and it was one of those, the cheesiest thing of like, you can literally do anything you say you can do. Mm-hmm. Like you just say it like, yep, I can do that. And now it's like, before it was just a cheesy saying. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, I did it. Yeah. I don't know how. I, just, <laughs> I feel like it just kind of <laughs> fell on my lap, but like it happened. So it's possible. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Man. And, but from like the moment, the day he asked me, well, yeah, it was Sunday night, put my two weeks in and then, Flew up to specialize, signed the contract, had a team camp, got the bikes. There's stories and all of that. But I think from the day I said yes to his, be his mechanic to the day I was in South Africa for the first World Cup was like two months or less. Wow. Like it was a snap of a finger and I was just gone, like thrown in the deep end. Luckily, I had John Kaniba there, sniper, and mm-hmm. EC like – like and sniper is like hey man like i got you i'll as soon as we get there he's like here's what we do here's the joke and it'd been like quite a few years since he'd been on the circuit but he's like some the schedule's different but he's like it never changes you know there's still everybody there that he knew from back in his gt days he's like i'm gonna take you around i'll introduce you to everybody takes me over shram introduced me to john dawson uh takes me over fox like i'm i kind of met those guys before a little bit but I'm like Fitzy was there Jordy was there and that was Jordy's first year because you guys were on SRAM and Fox at the same time yeah Aaron yeah. had like that special deal where the uh, team was a, was a SRAM team but Aaron was a Fox athlete and so to get Aaron specialized basically said like sorry guys this is what we got to do like if we want this guy his thing is he has to stay with Fox and but he'll run SRAM everything else and it was like a 
like a monumental thing back then. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, that was like that. a big thing yeah. for them. And I still don't think they've done anything like that since. And like probably wouldn't. So yeah, it was pretty cool. It was, um, I just look back at like, I was telling Aaron this the other day too. We had dinner and I was like, sometimes I have to tell myself that story often when I'm getting stressed out leading up to a mm. season of like, okay, like what parts haven't shown up yet? Who do I need to follow up with? What are we low on? What do we need to like replenish? Do we need to replenish it in Europe? Do we need to do it in the U S do I need to have it sent to an athlete's house? Like, what does this guy need? What does this guy need? Like make sure everybody has everything they need to go racing, to train, to do all the stuff while like helping develop the bike and input there and going into the race shop and intense, all stuff like that it gets all stressful. And I'm like, dude, when I first came on board with them, I was like, we went to South Africa after I said, I'd be your mechanic after like a couple months. I knew nothing. I knew nobody. <laughs> we had a bike that we were developing with specializers, like their first 650B bike, when they were actively marketing against 650B publicly, mm-hmm. which was like where they were like, you cannot let this bike be shot because people will know and we'll be outed kind of type of deal. Is <laughs> like we are now developing it. And then I was like, I think we had, it was Aaron, Troy, and Mitch Ropolato. Mitch was luckily... <laughs> love you mitch honest two nine enduro dead set on that everybody's like what are you doing and he's he's like, world champ, he's right? like you said that i shouldn't yeah. now i'm going to <laughs> 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 because i'm mitch ropolato i love the guy for it so he was on his enduro two nine and had kind of all of his own 67 spares. degree head angle or yeah, dude. yeah and what well, like qualifying second or something like that too or like for like qual- up there with him dude like he was on to something and so um yeah, so he kind of had all his spares for his 2.9. Aaron and Troy were on the 650s. I was literally going around the specialized office to like the tire development guys. I'm like, do you guys have any 650B tires? Like, what? Go one guy was like, I have one set here <laughs> that I'm like testing and I have to test and develop. <clears throat> like, I have to put these on my bike and test them. I'm like, can I have those? <laughs> He's like, no. <laughs> I was like, they're for Aaron Glenn. He's like, I don't care. <laughs> no. Oh, I was like, we have no tires. And he's like, find them. I'm like, you are did. the only ones that have them. <laughs> like, I have, I did find them. They're right here at your desk. Yeah. <laughs> and eventually, like, we got them and stuff. So we're going to, like, we're going to this World Cup with Aaron Gwynn, Troy Brazen, like, who in my eyes are just idols, right? <clears throat> like, mm-hmm. huge. And I'm like, I have two or three sets of tires, like, one set or one or two sets of, like, spare wheels because... JC had done the wheel order the year before no, or thinking that they were all on 26 inch bikes. They hadn't even started developing 275 or even told those guys. And so all the specialized guys were like, oh yeah, JC already ordered all the wheels and hub spokes. They're in the race cage. Go ahead. Like there they are. Start building. Okay, sweet. Open the first box, 26 inch. I'm like, that's not going to work. Went through every box, all 26 inch rims. I'm like, hmm, my God, who do I talk to here? Like go talk to Eric Carter and he's like, uh, Hey man, just email DT Swiss or our sponsor and tell him the situation. I was like, okay. Re- emailed him <laughs> and, um, Shane Hensley to this day and he works for intense now. <laughs> and so, uh, I emailed Shane and I got the response back. I kind of casual. I was like, Hey, with spe- John Hall was specialized I'm working for Aaron Gwynn this year. Like here's the deal. We're on 650. JC ordered all two six, not knowing, um, is there any way we can get some rims so I can get these and some new spokes to the proper length, stuff like that. And I got, I forget the exact response, something to the tune of what the hell are you talking about? If you needed this stuff, it should have been like ordered and submitted back in like October. And like, what are you talking about? No, we don't have 650B downhill rims to give you. Like we didn't know you guys were developing this. We And I was like, kind of in my mind, I'm like, Sorry, like I just got hired like four days ago. <laughs> new dude. guy, like, my bad. New guy, my bad. <laughs> who are you? Uh, yeah, exactly. Hundred percent. Like no clue who it was. <laughs> that's why. That's why your boss was like, "You should send that email." hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, yeah. He didn't want to get his ass You got this rude. Yeah. Good lessons. Um, and so, uh, oddly enough, like we had to run some Roval wheels because Specialized was also developing like their stock Roval 650B stuff. Same thing. That's why we only had like one or two sets of spare wheels. We had like a set for each rider, Aaron and Troy, and like one or two sets of spares to go to South Africa and Australia, like the first two rounds. And wow. Shane at DT was like, 
listen, dude, like, no, I can't get you anything right now in time for, because we were leaving like in a week to go to the first round. And so you can, I, looking at it now, if somebody emailed me a week before the first round, I was like, hey, can I get this that doesn't exist? I'd be like, <laughs> what? I, I'm surprised as he's as nice as he was. <laughs> like, I would lose my crap, dude. And so um, after the first couple of rounds, he was like, hey, we have these Enduro rims I can get you. We have plenty of them. They're the EX-471s. He's like, they're not downhill rated wheels. We don't recommend running, but it's all we have. I was like, done, send them, don't care. Like, we just need them and I want to be sponsor correct, sports brands, like, and be right. And he's like, okay, like just saying, let the guys know, be easy on them. Like he gave me like the full warning. And then that's the wheel that like Aaron did the, t- like the tireless rundown Leo gang and it held up. Like, and after that, everybody's like, we need those rims. And after that, every single DT Swiss team was on EX Force. Dude, their website, <laughs> the description for that rim is just a link to the video of him doing a yeah. run without a tire. I <laughs> yeah. love it. And it's so amazing. That's well, incredible. I've, I've told that story a couple times. I don't think ever like publicly on a podcast, but like we ran that wheel out of necessity. It wasn't everybody's like, oh, because I remember you know, it might have been like Loic or somebody coming by and they're like, dude, like you guys going Enduro wheels? Because the first race we had it was at. I don't know, Leo gang or something. They're like, are you doing like an enduro wheel to get a little bit lighter to roll a little bit faster? Like, yeah, definitely. totally. <laughs> oh, in my mind, I'm just like, it's all we could get, dude. <laughs> like, I just out of necessity. And then that just ended up being like a, like a really good wheel for the time being at the time. Um, I people think are still on still that. Is, rim. People yeah. are still on that in fact, rim. Yeah. The DT website is like, please don't buy this rim. We keep coming out with new rims. Buy one of those. Yeah, <laughs> yeah stop exactly. using this rim. But yeah, yeah. by yeah. the way, DT, I bought that rim twice because of that video. So <laughs> yeah. Worked, yeah, we should yeah. get <laughs> my downhill bike has those rims on it. Yeah, yeah. can we get checks? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> no, but dude, but to that point, like, dude, technology is greatly surpass the technology of that rim mm. to this day. I look at it, I'm like, I probably wouldn't run that rim <laughs> anymore now, guys. Like, for what these guys are doing on bikes and stuff and the wheels we're on right now, I'm like, <clears throat> blows those out of the water. Mm. Like, like, and it's not a sponsor plug. It's not whatever. It's like, we've been on these E13 wheels and like, you guys recently did a, mm-hmm. um, a pretty cool thing. I was like, oh, this will be interesting when I saw that come out. Like, between those, I'm like, I'm curious to know like what an unbiased opinion would be. Obviously, like, I come across as biased, but I'm like, I don't know. Like I keep my cards pretty fair. I'm like, I truly enjoy these wheels and they are bomb proof. And, um, I don't know if we're supposed to say it, but we're working on some new ones with them too. They're supposed to be even better. So, um, super excited to, to check those out and, and get those on the bikes and stuff like that. So it's like, it's one of those things where you're like, man, it's pretty darn good. And we're about to get them even better. So pretty pumped. So since we're talking about wheels, Oh boy. Tell us about spoke tension. <laughs> Tell us about spoke tension. You know, you wanna, guys... you know what's funny? That was question number two, actually. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. We really want to know good. about 20 real 32 hole. Yeah. Are you guys tuning for different courses? What do you got? As um, much as much as you're allowed to share. Yeah, no, that stuff is not like trade secret stuff, really. It's obviously it's all knowledge out there that everybody has at their um at their availability but um yes we will play with spoke tension for sure uh but there's always a point of diminishing return with that that's one of those things it's like you can get it and everybody's different and it depends on there's there's so many factors that Mm -hmm. come into that that it's like it's hard to just sit here and have a conversation about spoke tension you have to have a conversation about the spokes themselves the length that they are, um, you know, your ERD comes into effect and who makes the spokes, what's the budding, what's your rim material, 28 hole or 32 hole, two cross, three cross, obviously we're not running radial, but, um, all that stuff has an input and a factor and then rider style, what train are you riding it on? What kind of bike is it on your tire? Like, I think that's what a lot of people forget about is there's a lot of conversations on spokes, rim material, compliance is the big word nowadays, um, and all that kind of stuff. And we have to remember that, 
uh, I think I said it earlier, bicycles, it's some of all of its parts, like, and all of those parts are inputs and are going to give you different feedback, no matter what carbon versus aluminum handlebars, like that's going to change how a bike feels, how a rider sets a suspension up is going to have an effect on how those wheels feel. What kind of tire are you running is going to have an effect on what those wheels feel like. Frame flex. Frame flexor compliance, um, casing, compound, tread pattern. Like if you just, just the wheel itself, like you have a tire, a rim, the spokes and the hub, like all together. So it's a bigger conversation in my mind than just spoke tension. What do you run for spoke tension? It's like, I, I tell you, I run 69 kg <laughs> And like you could go put it on anything. It's going to feel different on every one mm-hmm. front wheel, rear wheel, left side, right side, brake side, non-brake side, all that kind of stuff. So to answer your question, yes, we do play with it and I guess modify it, but it's nothing crazy. Like we, we just back it off a little bit. Um, we don't hand build all of our wheels. Fun fact, we get them all straight from E13, um, built by them, mm-hmm. uh, saves us a ton of time. They're super reliable, but they are super tight. Um, and because it makes sense because they're typically going on a general consumer's bike to be never touched again, never touched ever. again. <laughs> right. So you have to consider the break in period and then, then everything's settling in. And then by that time, like they're pretty good. So out of the box, like we're just basically getting them to the already broken in mm-hmm. period. Um, and then check them and, and just stay on top of that. So um, yeah, we keep the brake side a little bit tighter than the non brake side because of the braking forces. Um, and then you're going to be, yeah, every ride is like different. Um, and so we just basically back them down a little bit. Yes, you can go too loose. Uh, and the bigger thing I think that has a more influence on what you're feeling is your rim material, mm-hmm. um, size width. We forgot about that even mm-hmm. like just rim dimensions. Well, like to go back to the 471 conversation, like there are guys who run the 471 at 25 mil or the 511 at 30 30 mil yeah. Yeah. because they say, oh, the wider one is stiffer and the 471 is a little skinnier. So it like flexes a little bit Is it a 2.9 or a 275? Yeah. The diameter of the wheel is going to have a characteristic on how much flex is into it or... And are you guys messing around with like front rear differences too? Like you might run a different rim front or rear or run different no. like spoke tension or butting or something front or rear no we try to keep uh like all the spokes are triple butted um keep them, we do run recently we've been trying different spokes in the front versus rear um triple so, butted for weight or for compliance just compliance okay yeah and, and a lot of this stuff is going into production with e13 so mm-hmm. it's like finding out what works really well for us. And then that's being passed on to consumers, which is always like the ultimate goal. Um, Not all of it or everything always will be good or translatable for customers, but 90% of it is like, if it's good for these guys, it will be good for you. I promise Mm -hmm. type of thing. A lot of people think like, well, they just do that for athletes or they just do that because these guys are the gnarliest guys and they require it. It's like, yes, you're correct but you will also benefit from this. Like it's not going to be bad for you because it's under an athlete type of thing. Well, and no one's harder on equipment than a beginner athlete using it incorrectly. hundred percent. Right. Like it's almost hard sometimes. Like Aaron's such a smooth rider and I love that for my job, Mm -hmm. but sometimes it's hard to develop stuff. Like he's had like lots of prototype stuff and lots of development stuff and that he's had on his bike and it's been on there for a very long time. It's like, yeah, man, sick, no issues, nothing like that. Like put it on Dakota's bike. He's like, I did three runs on it. It blew up. (laughs) Well, that's why you have him. Yeah, exactly. And (laughs) even Joe and Seth and stuff like that. It's like all these guys put their equipment through different forces at different paces. Like Joe is a hooner and he cranks laps. Like he's been gone for like the last two weeks doing like, I don't even know how many laughs, but riding every single day. And it's like, we're seeing things and hearing things and learning things through all of that, where it's like, you get guys who maybe don't need as much time on the bike or so they don't spend as much time on the bike or, or whatever. And it's like, so then you're like, Oh, like everything's good. And then you get a guy who's like, I've been on this thing for 20 laps a day for 60 days. <laughs> this is what I've seen. You're like, thank God we have. <laughs> like, are you Joe and Seth's mechanic too then? 
No. They have their own? They, every rider has their own mechanic oh, okay. or program. Yep. But I guess I'm kind of like the, again, I hate this stuff, but I guess I'm the head mechanic. So it's a lot of their mechanics will come to me or they, and I'm so close to the engineers and the development side of things that it's like, I just like know all the little, contact. yeah, it's like yeah. all the little intricacies or every little step and change along the way. It's like, Hey, what's the update? What have they changed? What are we working on? Like, or when I send them something new, it's like, okay, here's what you need to know about building this bike mm-hmm. or the hardware on this bike, like torque specs. Here you go. Like all fire drill stuff. protocol. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. The brake does not fit through the shock tunnel. <laughs> Redo everything. Yeah. You guys well, will punch a hole in the number plate while you're at it. Yeah. <laughs> Joe was a soccer player before. Really? Yeah. Joe I'm, Breeden. Yeah, I'm almost certain. Was Joe, like, I'm sorry. I didn't know that about you. A semi-professional. Like, I don't know if it was pro or semi-professional, but he was like, get out of here. No, going super hard on that and then dabbled in bike riding. And so I think if you can... Can I text him right now? <laughs> you should. You should double check that. Like, okay. I might, and we'll have a little disclaimer if I'm wrong but oh, yeah sorry right uh we'll have a little disclaimer if i'm wrong about that but i'm almost certain but, I, uh, what do you want me to ask were you a semi-professional <laughs> soccer player football, football or soccer yeah, football. well yeah european football, football soccer. american soccer but um <laughs> i mean if you can have the willpower to just dribble a soccer ball maybe she's a soccer ball mode for hours and days forever like that's all they do they just do the same drills over and over and over again he must be like dude i did 20 laps on a bike today it was amazing not only that (laughs) not only is he gonna put the time in but um he's very technical like Mm. in the weeds detail which it's sometimes i'm like oh my gosh dude and then there's other times where you're like no this is good like he cares about every intricate millimeter and angle like down to the t so like if something's not quite right or not quite there like he's gonna find it and that's what you need when you're developing a bike like, mm-hmm. it's super helpful it's cool as a mechanic too like your level because you're in tune with that stuff anyways you're like oh yeah sure why not yeah like might as well yep we yeah and joe's one of those guys who's he'll he's going to try everything and to go to two to a point like he'll try a lot of things speaking of let's talk about that handlebar height Oh my gosh, he knows where I stand on this. Because Aaron <laughs> has, wait, we don't. <laughs> yeah, we want to people. Want to Aaron know. is kind of like low bar guy. Is and he not super low? He's, but he's been he's been I going like he's up been below bit. average over the years. Well, like, everyone yeah. is low bar guy compared to Dakota. Well, of so, I might not be. But you have that's high bar guy. They look like opposites. <laughs> like when they're two bikes are next to each other, they're like, I know whose bike is whose. Dakota's yeah. trying to turn his downhill bike into a dirt bike. And he tries to turn his dirt bike into a mountain bike. (laughs) Like he's blending the two in every sense that he possibly can. I forget. I'm like, I follow dirt bikes and racing and supercross mode and all that kind of stuff pretty closely. But the technical side, I don't follow that much. And he's telling me about some, it wasn't a recluse. Don't call me out on that. It was something else is either a, a lever or something to do with the clutch. And what he was wanting to do and some modification. And I was like, get you trying to make a shift like a mountain bike now. He's like, (laughs) yeah. And that was my realization. I was like, you're trying to turn your mountain bike into a dirt bike. And now you're trying to turn your dirt bike (laughs) into a mountain bike. He's like, yeah. (laughs) It's like, oh my gosh, dude. Yeah. yeah. But, (laughs) but Hey, listen, at the end of the day, you can sit there and pick apart every detail or call them out on whatever you want to call about. Who's standing on the podium at the end of the day? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. working. Yeah, it definitely works. Yeah. Low bar guy and high bar guy. <laughs> <laughs> the both of them. <laughs> no joke. They were on the podium together. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so you can sit there and be like, ah, man, I don't think I agree with what you're doing. But mm-hmm. when he's sitting there with his hands up yeah. and they called the Go- Dakota Norton or Aaron Gwynn from the USA, I don't, you kind of lost your leg to stand on. seeing eye to eye. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> but um, so that's where it's been super interesting getting to know Dakota more and he's dude. He's so he knows like he knows what he wants and he knows why it's sometimes it takes him a while to learn that. And what he's doing is exploring things to figure it out and to learn that. And that's just, that's what you're supposed to do, right? Like mm-hmm. figure out what you want, what you like, what you don't like, explore things. And then, ask people who know more than you about it and then take that information and apply it to what you're doing. And like, that's what he does. And he just does it over 
and over and over again. So he said it. He's like, he knows. So with his bar position, his bar height and everything like that, he goes, it's just my posture. It's his riding posture. He goes, he goes, it just, it is what it is. This is my riding posture. And to be comfortable and fast or fast and I want to say comfortable at speed, this is what I have to do to my setup to be, to go as fast as I can go and be comfortable and safe. Okay. And then you look at Aaron's riding style and he's very flat back, but he's wide. He's got mm-hmm. big chest, big arms, big shoulders. And he's so dialed. Yeah. Like it's... when you watch his tires go by, they're just glued to the glued ground. Glued to the ground. Yeah. He knows where he's going within an inch or two. Yeah. Like everything is calculated and you look at his style and he'll, that visor's like this far above his stem, <laughs> like, and he's low and it's like, it's textbook, right? But he has this like big, strong upper body to take those hits or those impacts when they happen. And Dakota's like, he'll just straight up raise his hand pick. I'm not there yet. Mm-hmm. I can't do that. My back doesn't, my back's rolled and hunched over. And, and, but I need to be in this position and this is how I go fast. So I was having this thought the other day and I'm like, whether it's winning or success or whatever it is, like it's a recipe. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, and there is, how many recipes are there out there for spaghetti? Mm -hmm. Thousands. Like it's noodles and meat and sauce. You know what I mean? Like those are your ingredients, but recipes are like completely different. And every rider, athlete, whoever, like you have to find what is your recipe. Some people are like, I need to measure every single ingredient exactly by the teaspoon or a cup and I'm going to take a knife and it's going to be, I'm going to scrape it across the top. It's going to be every, no extra, no less than anything that I need. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to put it in there. And I would say like, that's Joe. Like Joe is very detailed and like would probably be like that. And Dakota's the dude who's like, I'm going to throw a little salt in and just be like, yep. and a little bit of pepper <laughs> and then like a friggin' some of this and a little bit of that. And like, how's that taste? Like it tastes like shit. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's try it again. A little bit less of that, a little bit more of that, and I'll maybe let's try some of this. Let's pour some of this stuff in there. How's that taste? Like, oh, it's a lot better. Sweet. Let's move forward with that. And like, so I think, and I think that's every athlete or team or anybody, like you just have to figure out. There's no, nobody can, you, you can't ask anybody, right? You can't go up and be like, how do you win? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> There's a thousand ways to win. You just have to be the fastest. It just has to be good. Like, Mm -hmm. and there's a hundred, you can train. Some guys don't train and do really well. Some guys train their ass off and they're in 40th. Mm -hmm. Like, and you're just like, what is it about it? And I think that'll be a question forever. Like, what is a winning recipe? You're like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's different every year and it changes. It's a moving target. And hopefully you get it right when it's your time kind of type of thing. So, uh, you know, again, back to it's like, I can sit there and, whatever you want to call it, make fun of it, say he's wrong, say he's weird. It doesn't matter. Like that dude's going fast at the end of the day and he's figuring out what makes him go fast. And it's like, if, if we have something that we can help him do that, all of our athletes, Aaron, Dakota, Seth, Joe, whatever you need, like, and if we can provide it and if that's, what's going to make you go fast, anybody can have an opinion on it, myself included. It doesn't matter. Like here, you want to try aluminum wheels? There you go. Try them out. Mm-hmm. Haven't worked for us in the past, but shit, they might work for you. Like, go. And if it works for you, great. Do everything you possibly can to make sure you have everything you need to go fast and win. So that's all that matters at the end of the day, really. So it's like, oh yeah, all the opinions and yeah. stuff like that. And that's, yeah, that's funny. Can't quite get caught up in all the internet drama and opinions. and like, Yeah. yeah. No, that was very well said. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. I just look at him like, that's just it. Mm -hmm. There's no, if there was a recipe that was like, this is what you need to do to win. We'd have way more winners out there. Yeah. (laughs) You wouldn't have Aaron and Greg at the top who've Mm -hmm. won that many races. And it's like, you can go out there and do the exact same thing that they did. And you're not going to win as many races as they did. Just not just, Mm -hmm. but that's, I think that's what's so sick about racing. Mm-hmm. And like, why, why I always will be, there's always the questions of like, oh, like, why do we race and budgets and marketing and stuff? Cause it's friggin' sick. <laughs> <laughs> like, and they do cool <laughs> things to rad dicks and like, it's fun to watch. Mm-hmm. But even the most dominant downhill season, well, if you dig into, 
if you didn't do it, the most dominant downhill season is going to be like a Rachel Atherton or a um, Ann Carroll. But for mm-hmm. for dudes, is Aaron in mm-hmm. 2012 winning what five? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that's a, five. That's about half, right? Five, five of seven. That was more than half. But then world champs too, right? So five of eight. Five of eight, still more now. It's a little bit more than half, but my <laughs> point is majority. the most dominant season oh, he's ever. Good. He still didn't win three. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yep. even the most dominant performance you've seen from a male athlete at the top of his game is like, wow, he's still. Yeah. And well, mm-hmm. and the other thing too is like, maybe some people do know, but I don't know if they comprehend what actually has to happen in a race run to win. Mm-hmm. And it's not, it's very easy. It's a cop out to say everything has to go perfect. Cause even you can ask people who won by six seconds, like, no, nah, it wasn't my perfect run. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like it was their best run or that, that run was just better than everybody else's. But I don't know anybody who said I've had the perfect run. You know what I mean? And so it's not that everything has to go perfect, but there are so many factors and so many things that do have to go right to win. And there's no way to predict that. Mm-hmm. And there never will be. Because again, if there was, you it would just be a cheat code. Mm-hmm. Then it wouldn't be that cool. And that's why racing's so sick. Like it's, it's like, you just never know on any given weekend. You're not sure who's going to win. You could, there's a lot of good guesses, you know, people consistency and, all this kind of stuff and good people. There's always dudes are going to be up there, but man, you still never know. There's even this past year, Aaron, I think it was probably two, maybe three rounds where he was like, I had the win. That was like, there was a couple things that happened. And if those things wouldn't happen, I could have had it. Hmm. He's a freak when it comes to time. Mm-hmm. And like, uh, yeah, he's crazy with that. Right? Mm-hmm. Jason knows. Like, and if you've spent any time around him at races, wow, it's gnarly. Like, he will come down from a run. Let's just say, let's just throw an arbitrary, make up an arbitrary race run. He comes down and he goes into the hot seat and he dropped eighth from last. So there's seven more guys to go. And he'll go into the hot seat and everybody's like, yeah. And you'll see him there and he's like, hmm. And he's like leaned over to team managers or teammates before, and he's gone. That's not the winning run. The winning run is going to be like 2.3 seconds faster than mine. I'll get fourth. Dude, winning run, like 2.15 seconds faster. And you're like, what? Mm -hmm. Like his, his, I don't even comprehension of time and where he lost it and gained it. And what the winning run will be, like, could probably make somebody millions if we were betting on downhill races. Like, <laughs> it's almost Rain Man like. It, it's he's within now half a second is a lot in racing, but he's within a half a second. Like, if just guessing and watching and knowing people's riding styles and the times and and how he rode something mm-hmm. and where he lost his time and like every little mistake, it's almost like he's a calculator as mm-hmm. he's going down that doesn't distract him during race runs, but it's like, it could be like a little, whatever, whatever constitute a mistake in his mind. Right. But it goes, he'd be like, boom, mistake. That's this much time ride. Another mistake. That's this much. And so as soon as he crosses the line, he goes, I could have been 3.6. I think my, my best run would have been three, about three and a half seconds faster. And then you'd look at like final times and he would have won by like 1.8. Had he mm-hmm. given those, gotten those three point six seconds or something like that? And it's like, yep, it's about right. That's what I thought. And you're just like, <laughs> what? So and nuts. I've watched it happen so many times. Like, it never it was never like a one time thing. Yeah, it's happened so many times. I know you've like heard him talk mm-hmm. about it and seen it and stuff. Like, it's crazy how in tune he is with time. It's wild. And nice. we'll be wildly late to anything. <laughs> <laughs> Time on the racetrack. Time on the racetrack. Only on the racetrack. On the racetrack. Uh-huh. We, I, dude, he, I give him so much crap. We talk about it all the time. It'll, it'll almost be like, yo, like breakfast, 8.30? Yep. We'll be like 8.24. And he'll be like, yo, be there like 9. 
If I had had the turtle, so light, like, it would have been three minutes faster. Always, <laughs> always, always, dude. Like, it'll be like, yo, shuttle tomorrow, like 10 o'clock. And I just write back, be like, yeah, sick. See you at 1030. <laughs> he just laughs. laughs. Sure, like 10, 15. He's like rolling up. He's like, look, I'm early. <laughs> like, You're 15 minutes late. He's like, yeah. what are you talking about? Uh, Is he that friend where when he sends you the text, like, I'm on the way. He's still totally changing. No, no, yeah, no, no. He is like if he says he's on the way, he's actually on the way. Okay, uh, but like it'll be you'll literally be at the trailhead and be like nine forty five and be like I'm supposed to be here at ten. He's like about ten fifteen. I'm gonna get a text saying, "Yo, just left. Be there in a few. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> we're here." Uh, but he knows it. He just laughs. But he's like, uh, we had this conversation too. He's like a big picture guy or like a big task guy. So it's like, he's the guy that will let a mountain of junk mail grow on the countertop. <laughs> just never look at it. Never touch. Like, it's all stuff you got to go through and like either shred and, you know, just double check some stuff, whatever, open it, go through. Like he will just nap. But like the big ticket items, like big conversations, sponsor deals, like hard conversation with somebody or something like that. Like he's like, yep, let's do it. Hop on, boom, make the phone call and just like, <laughs> hammer out like the stuff that most people would be like oh i want to avoid this like this is gonna really suck he's like nah let's do it bring it on i'll do that <laughs> but like the dishes in the sink or like the stack of mail he's like mm, nah <laughs> i've got time for that <laughs> it's funny dude he'll be the first one That's to amazing. tell you it's awesome and now you guys used to live like an hour and a half apart like he was in Temecula, you were in yeah, San one, Diego County. No, at one point, no, I've never lived in San Diego. Um, at one point, he's in Temecula, and I was in Marietta or Menifee. Uh, we we're like friggin' 10, 15 minutes from each other, like at our closest. Yeah, yeah. And Super now handy. he's in Tennessee. Yep. But like Tennessee and Montana. No, his uh, wife's family, and she grew up in Montana, and so they had a place. They got a place out there originally to have a spot closer to her family um, for training and stuff like that. And then um, it actually just worked out better to actually be in Tennessee. And so they just kept that place and then got their place in Tennessee. So how does that change your like off season regimen? And, um, and this is the first year doing it. So it's just kind of been figuring it out. Um, but I do a lot more with intense now spending a little bit more time there helping on the development side of things, all of that. So if there's testing to be done and we need to get it done, then I'll fly out to Windrock and Aaron and Dakota are right there together. So it's very easy to fly out there and test with those two guys. Joe's harder and he's in the UK. Seth, he's clear up in Canada. Um, and so it's harder to get to those guys, but a lot of things that we need to test or verify, we're going to run through Aaron and dakota first anyway so it's very easy to knock those two guys out and get them out there so this first round of testing on the new bike once we were done with it and it was ready for those guys just hop on a flight fly out there bang it out for like four or five days whatever do whatever we had to do and then fly home and then keep working on whatever we need to work on back here so if you need something ship it um whatever so he's just kind of living his day-to-day -day. everybody's kind of doing their own thing through the off season and hammering away training riding doing mm -hmm. all that stuff i'm back here working on bikes um pushing development along alongside of intense just helping out and pushing whatever project on the bike or other bikes and stuff like that need to happen and are all four of your athletes qualified to touch their own bikes with tools <laughs> <sighs> Yeah. Has to think about it. Long yeah, thoughts. I, I had to like, I had to go so through long. like each one and what I know. I'm so, I mean, Joe, I've known Dakota mm -hmm. like just through U.S. racing for a while now, but last year's first year <clears> he was on the team at like so being that close. Joe was like first time meeting him last year, first time on the team, stuff like that. Joe's pretty switched on. Like he's pretty smart. Um, yeah, I think Joe can handle all of his own bike work. He his mechanic lives super close, fairly close by um, as well back home. So. He just doesn't have to. He's got a guy right there that can drop stuff off, get rebuilt, do all that kind of stuff. Um, so, but Joe can, yeah, he can handle his own stuff. Dakota, for sure. He's done all of his own stuff for years, full like privateer style. It may not be to like my standards or a, a World Cup standard, but he can get stuff done. He can handle all of his own stuff. Um, I love the FaceTimes that I get from Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> they are. 
it's like when I get the text or if I get a FaceTime from Dakota, I'm just like, this is going to be a good one. Like, what are we <laughs> dealing with right now? Because it's never just to say, hey, man, what's up? Hope you're doing good. <laughs> like, just checking in. <laughs> it's always like, hey, man, um, swapping wheels and <laughs> the cassette fell off. <laughs> you're like, oh, it's okay. Or whatever. I don't know. I just made that up. But yeah. it's always something. But he can. He, yeah, he's perfectly capable. He works on all the dirt bikes and that kind of stuff, too um aaron yeah he's perfectly capable doesn't like to the big ticket stuff on bikes oddly enough like no he's not going to service his own suspension or anything like that but yeah no he's washed his bike maintain it like he's really good at maintaining things so he doesn't have to work on it and seth is yeah seth is fine he's a kid he laughs dude he's like He's like, I've been working on my own bike. And I'm always like, oh, man. He's like, yeah, wait till you hear some of the crap that I've been doing. <laughs> I'm like, dude. I'm trying some new stuff. Oh, out. my gosh. <laughs> but he's, yeah, he's fine, too. Yeah, they're all perfectly fine. I don't know if they'd all want to go race World Cups on the bikes that they've all worked <laughs> on. But they'd probably want them once over by us, I'm sure. But, um, yeah, no, they're all good. Yes, we yes. we have questions from the Instagram Right now, live yeah, questions. Got a few. Nice. I think we post. We posted something, right? Post like an hour ago. Mm-hmm. Sick. Um, no confirmation see. on Joe being a professional soccer player, though. By the way, yeah, I really want to know about that. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I'm like, I spent a lot of time with him. He never mentioned this. <laughs> Show so was with a soccer ball. Never came <laughs> up once. There is one thousand percent a UK downhill pro who used to be a soccer. Pro, and I'm just racking my brain familiar. like maybe he'll know. I I think this is Joe Breeden, so I just putting out there could be very wrong about this. But <laughs> he looks like a soccer player. Like he looks like he could he could rule on. Does that. he wear Adidas mm-hmm. Sambas all the time? No, yeah. but slides are a big thing with Dakota and Frida. Oh my like, god, mm. dude, that that dude lives just in slides. An athlete thing, and I can't blame him. They look real comfy. Look really <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I. Don't fall like steel toe boots those. or something like that. I definitely don't. I'm no, just yeah. a straight Vans guy. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, yeah. Speaking of off-season activities, Tanner Stevens, long-time listener of the podcast. <laughs> What's um, up, Tan man? Yeah. Uh, are you going to wrap up the Fontana Winter Series over? <laughs> <laughs> he also wants to know how's the testing with the SoCal Speed Team been going. So. Oh, that's great, dude. The SoCal Speed Team group text that we have, uh, the board members yeah faculty the faculty uh is constant entertainment i one day i'm just gonna save it all i've never deleted it we'll publish it one day <laughs> Dude, it's just nothing but laughter and and jibbing each other man um yeah i've started racing fontana just because i was like well it's like first off season i haven't had aaron to worry about at fontana or be out there for practice and just help him like towing him up with the e-bike or anything like that or just being there so i was like well screw it like put me in coach. put me in like let's ride <laughs> let's let's get some more riding in let's do some racing like let's see how the bike feels on track like no i'm not gonna make any changes to it that's gonna affect development but put me in coach like there's an extra frame here let's build it up let's go and so uh yeah i went out and signed and like intense really encourages all the employees to go race as well hmm. Um, I forget what it is, but we cover a certain amount of, uh, race entry fees for our employees. Um, everybody gets a bike every year, um, as like a, it's basically like a long-term demo that they get for a year and then they turn it in at the end of the year. That bike goes into a demo fleet that then goes out to the public and then they get a new bike. So it's an opportunity for every employee to ride each model of bike and really have like a firsthand experience of what each one feels like. Mm -hmm. And so when people come up and like, Oh, you work for intense. What do you think of this bike? Like now they'll have firsthand knowledge of Mm. all these bikes that they've actually ridden and owned for a period of time. Um, and so that's super rad. And so it's just racing is just encouraged like where Mm -hmm. we work. And so like, heck yeah, we're going out there and there's members of the CEO team that I'm out there riding and racing with. (laughs) Yeah. What do I think of the bike? Pull up the roots and rain profile. Check yeah. out the results. Yeah. Is, are there results on there? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so here we go. <laughs> oh, no. So it was, so Nick just loves to encourage it. And he just bring Nick Nestor off. He just laughs yeah. about it. And he's like, John, how'd your race go? And I was like, dude, first one, I was like, I got second, dude, by like, I forget how much. And then one race I lost by like 
did no joke. I think it's point zero one or something like that. <laughs> and he's like, "Did you put trail tires on?" I was like, "No." He's like, "That was it, dude." You That's didn't put trail tires, tires on. Absolutely not. Not on dude. the rear. Have no, no, no. Well, I'm, is it because you've been we're talking? You've been wrenching for Aaron. I, so. I could go and get a tracer, like a one our one seventy trail bike, and smoke and everyone. S- I don't want to say smoke everyone. Let's not get. <laughs> 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 I try to keep my head out of the clouds. <laughs> and, also, but who knows? We could be probably take shave a little bit of time off. But a, like heck no, I'm racing downhill. Let's ride the downhill bike. Let's yeah. put some downhill tires on this thing. Like <laughs> let's keep it old school. Let's keep it real. Um, <laughs> and so one. John I Hall, 22 pro. events. Does that sound 22 right? 22 events? Have I? We've got John Colin Hall. No, John Tyler and Hall. And John Hall, 22 events. Wow. I was going to ask if you'd raised much before this year. Mm, just or, or oh, had it yeah, been a while? Like early days. A lot of Fontana. A lot, lot of Fontana. Fontana. <laughs> okay, how, wait, but how's the overall looking? <laughs> this year? Yeah. Am I leading the overall? Uh, I don't know if that'll tell us that. I think I've, yeah. had, I've had all seconds and like one fourth. And the fourth that Someone's I got, I was, like, I was like, mm. dang, I got smoked. And then like first through fourth was separated by like 0. 0.41 or something like Damn, that. I was man. like, dude, we got the, and then Nick, the mix. Nick just fires in the group text. He's like the 30 to 39 expert class is where it's at. Like that's the <laughs> true race. Nobody cares about pro anymore. Like there's just tight times. Yeah. There is some prototype bikes. Like, dude, yeah. We're <laughs> serious. It's next. Level. <laughs> so call it out. Who's, who is like the guy you're gunning for in 30 to 39? Or is um, different? Is it Corey? Is it Zach? Is it Tyler? It's Tyler. <laughs> Tyler. Yeah. Tyler. Yeah. Yeah. Me and Tyler battle. Tyler won the last one. He so, did. Dude. Yeah. Although, guys, we're talking much to his less than half a second. Point yeah. Four. Yeah. I'm telling you, dude, that's the <clears> class <throat> to watch. Wow. Yeah. You want to watch pro for the for the speed, but you want to see battles. Thirty three nine yeah. experts. You want to Fontana is where it's <laughs> at. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know, dude. I'm a. I say I'm not a fair weather racer, but there's a storm brewing. I don't know if I'm going to be racing this weekend, guys. Mm. Not with that attitude. You're going to let Tyler win again? Oh, boy. If he shows up. <laughs> could yeah, be he might heat, dude. If he doesn't show up, you got it. In hey, the could be yeah, snow on the ground, too. It could be a snow race. Yeah. You know Donnie, rain or shine. Good yeah. Thing got, good thing you got downhill tires. <laughs> rain or exactly. shine. Exactly. I've down. been training for this race the entire time. Everybody's going to be on these trail bikes with trail tires. Jokes like, on them. <laughs> jokes on them. I'm going to drop a couple PSI. Yeah. Got the Loosen the spokes. Well, yeah. I mean, we can't give too much. But. Yeah. I'm not going to give away trade tickets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not everybody can win Fontana. <laughs> <laughs> no, it takes a special breed to win Fontana. It's yeah. its own. You have to want to hurt. Downhill bike, nonetheless. Yeah. You want to hurt. Uh-huh. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. Man, I will tell you this, too. If anybody knows who Craig Harvey is, that man is finished. He races Vet Pro and just smokes everybody all the time. That man has finished his race run, changed, in, changed his clothes, got his dog and is walking up the wall to go watch the rest of the racing and the last like three races i've been coming down the wall just dying and i look up and there's craig <laughs> every time and i'm like no dude and he's just like get up john hall go and i'm like oh, right when you want to quit this is me yeah, going right when you're yeah, this is dude i'm going this is everything that i have you've seen me every week you know this is me going like, just let me go <laughs> Yeah. The wall is amazing because you can be pedaling as hard as you possibly can and feel like you're going backwards. You will also yeah. always hear somebody screaming, paddle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You will be as if you're renting not. your mind out, trying to breathe and not throw up, and you'll hear some 14 and under's mom, paddle, which I love you, whoever you are out there. Please <laughs> Yeah. Keep the encouragement high. <laughs> but if we're already sprinting our minds out, you don't like, have to remind maybe us a to keep continue. it up. <laughs> yeah. You're doing you know, great. That's what I'm talking about or something like or that. Or breathe. Like, yeah, Oddly breathe. enough, you forget to breathe <laughs> mm-hmm. when you're, that, that when was you're my maxing out. That's what I always had my dad yell at me. I'm like, yeah. don't tell me to pedal. Remind me to breathe. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> dude. It, and it mm-hmm. will be, it sounds like the stupidest thing and everybody who's raced knows this, but like somebody will breathe and you'll just go, <gasps> And you're like, oh my gosh, I wasn't breathing. Like, I needed that. <laughs> that Thank really you. Works. That really works. I needed that reminder. I appreciate that. It's wild. Oh, uh, the yep. wall. Did uh, Rich Houseman used to like camp out on the wall? I don't know if you ever told these stories yesterday. We did talk about that a little Dude, bit. He would camp out on the wall. Sometimes he would sprint on foot after mm-hmm. you and ri- like Gwynny. 
<laughs> or he would be on his trail bike, and as soon as Gwenny would pass, uh-huh. he would be behind him, come out of the bushes, just out of the bushes on <laughs> your tail, going. You just hear him back there going, "Go, go!" Like just in the <laughs> scariest voice, "Sprint!" And you're just like, "I'm, I'm gonna get eaten by a bear." Yeah. I think I think there's a bear behind me, and it's just rich, like making sure that you haven't given up yet. He used to do it for all you guys too. Mm-hmm. We we did talk about that yeah. because I remember the wall has a a kink in it, a bend. Yeah, and you're kind of going downhill, and when you turn, you just are looking down the barrel of <clears throat> a flat death. hundred yard sprint. Yeah. And I remember because I would be coming down that last little bit before it turns, and I would like gather myself not just to pedal but to have to pedal as hard as i can because he's watching yeah <laughs> you well, know like, and you're like your team manager is going to judge you by the next hundred yard sprint you and you're almost you almost feel line. bad yeah, like, fontana contract yes. and mm-hmm. you almost feel bad for that moment that you took to collect yourself because totally. yeah, yeah. you're like he saw me stop yeah <laughs> and take and, and take a second and he's not going to be happy about mm-hmm. that <laughs> like mm-hmm. he wanted to see Death and I just put the pedal on the wall. Like I'll only Fontana a few times, but like the little rock bits. There's that are one rock. It, I There's would find one them. rock you have to avoid. Like, that you find like just, every time. Just like, well, and depending made it through on the, the whole track, yeah. no problems. And then as soon as you need to pedal, you can't because you mm-hmm. built the pedal. Yeah. <laughs> depending on the course, like fifty percent of the time. There's like an uphill pedal before the wall section. You it's, know, there's like it's the there now. Wall. It's little, currently yeah. enabled. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's on there. So you're like gassed at the start of the wall, and you're like, okay, this is gonna be great. The first race, and this is not gonna make any sense for anybody who hasn't raced Fontana, but the first race was like that main rock garden that spits you out on the fire road before you cross the asphalt. Mm-hmm. So it spits you out on the dirt fire road. Then you got to climb mm-hmm. up this fire uphill. road uphill. Mm-hmm cross a flat road and then do a flat sprint, a short one, and then go up on that plateau. Mm -hmm. And so it's like this short, punchy, like it's like a punchy enduro climb. Mm -hmm. It's maybe only like 30 feet, 20, 30 feet, Mm -hmm. but you're gassed and you're in the wrong gear because you've been sprinting (laughs) uphill. (laughs) uphill. And then you're in the hardest gear and you get like, and there's like these little rocks that you have to weave through. And so you can't (laughs) pedal because you'll clip a rock. Mm -hmm. And then and you're, you're the, basically blacking out. You're blacking out. <laughs> you're in the <laughs> hard. You're, thinking about is you're in the wrong gear. It's too hard. So you just feel like you're molasses. And then there's um there's a, a lady of a flagger and that's always there. And it's always like you're doing great. <laughs> and <laughs> and you're like I'd rather you didn't say that. All you hear. Oh, you did that. Good job. You're just like. That's what I'm asking for. I, you didn't say pedal. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. But then she also didn't say breathe. Yeah, I need a, I need a breathe reminder, yeah. mm-hmm. and then you hit the wall, mm-hmm. and then you go down and hit the wall. Yeah, and if you haven't been there, you're looking at about barely over two minutes, hundred <laughs> yeah. percent for your entire race, or not just the like wall. 10. You have yeah. forty five seconds of downhill and one minute and fifteen seconds of sprinting a downhill mm-hmm. bike, and then about two hours of coughing up blood afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> just and the dust. If you're an American athlete now, you're ready to race in the Alps. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 You can you can get a good gauge on fitness in Fonte. If there's one thing that place will give you is a gauge on fitness. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. wow. Yeah. Get your starts in. You know. Get, get your some sprints reps in. in. Yeah. Holy smokes! Your intervals. Mm. Mm-hmm. Goodness. Bike set up just a glimpse. Fitness a whole lot more. Mm-hmm. Um. Thoughts on e enduro racing. My thoughts. Yeah. Um. Interesting. I've never done it. Um, only seen it kind of from a glance at the World Cup level when they first brought it on. I actually spoke with my old team manager at Specialized uh, after Eric Carter, uh, Ben O'Willett. He's still there, still runs kind of the main program. And he was heading that up and stuff like that. And it was interesting talking to him about it, just about... Um, I didn't know anything like what the rules were and all that kind of stuff, power and all that stuff. So those bikes go through a full inspection. Like you, there is a time that the mechanics have to turn the bike in. It gets fully inspected and then it goes into quarantine. Like Mm. you don't get your bike back Hmm. and it's guarded and like nobody, you can't modify your bike. It's not like you pass inspection and take it back to the truck and then plug it in and open the motor or anything Mm. like that. Like they make sure you haven't done anything to it, that it's all 
correct in the way it's supposed to be. Um, and then it goes into quarantine and you don't get that bike till like the start line or like just before maybe practice or something like that. And then straight into whatever. So, um, really no opinion on, I personally love e-bikes. I think they're sick. I know there's a ton of hate on them. I think it's coming around a little bit. For sure. It's only um, people who haven't ridden them. Always. Yeah. yeah. When I, the, the first one I ever rode, I kind of just reserved judgment and then I rode one and I was like, oh, the only people that don't like these yeah, are the, the most ones that ever. don't have one or yeah. haven't ridden one. And I'm like, this thing's sick. <laughs> and honestly, it's like a, a friggin' e-bike and a downhill bike. Deadly combo. Like, mm-hmm. that's all you need. You go do slap laps on the DH bike and then just. Yeah, like, we, we talked about that last time. Like, yeah. dual crown e-bikes are just insane. Yes, it's absolutely. all you ever want to ride yeah. and you don't need anyone but yeah. yourself to go ride it. We have our, like, our Taser MX, like first kind yeah. of built and marketed towards <clears> like our moto crowd. So like, yeah, moto dudes love triple cramps and big forks and stuff <laughs> like, like that. like a dirt bike. And it's got a motor, like they're going to love this. And then it was like, we rode it and we're like, actually, this is pretty sick. <laughs> <laughs> like, heck yeah. <laughs> Let's throw a freaking 40 on this thing. <laughs> like, this is it's awesome. It's only getting better. Just... This is awesome. This is sick. And you just pedal everywhere. But like for me, dude, I'm not an athlete, clearly. <laughs> and, but like in the Fontana. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I mean, humble okay. guy over yeah. here. Yeah. We'll yeah. keep humble. We'll keep humble. <laughs> but like all my, all my buddies that I race with are all freaking World Cup or enduro athletes mm-hmm. like Nick Nestroff, Charlie Harrison, Aaron Gwynn. It's like, it's not brag on it, but it's like, those are the only dudes I ride bikes with. Mm-hmm. I can't get on a trail bike and go keep up with Charlie Harrison. I can't. Mm-hmm. The dude is an absolute animal mm-hmm. to this day. I don't care if he says he's retired. We're going to see that kid back on downhill bike. I, Charlie, I know it. He hates me saying that, but <laughs> that's what we like to hear. Yeah, yeah no, so. we're probably not, but I, I'm going to continue to encourage it. It's the optimism <laughs> we need. And, but dude, he is such an animal on the bike that I've been on the e-bike putting out a decent amount of effort to keep up with him on climbs. And he's on a friggin' acoustic bike. I'm like, what? I get to the top and I'm like, what in the world is wrong with you? <laughs> Why do you like to do this to yourself Never still? Let the machine I there. thought you were retired. <laughs> but it's like, he has such a sick mentality. Like, if I could just copy paste that kid's mentality into people or myself, like, I love it. You should see our text thread too. We're like, basically like, two david goggins with each other just <laughs> text each other motivational quotes and stay hard <laughs> i'll just wake up in the morning be like 5 30 in the morning i'll just get a text from Charlie. actually not because he doesn't touch his phone for a certain amount of time after he wakes up in the morning very responsible very mm-hmm. responsible we call him colonel chuck and <laughs> so but like i'll just send motivate i'll be like hey nobody likes to do hard stuff but the hard stuff is where the rewards are. And I'll just send him that text at like five 30 in the morning. And then when he checks his phone and he'll just say, yes, thank you. <laughs> and rise like, and grind, bro. Rise and grind. Or if like, <laughs> if either of us are working out, like I'll just send him a picture of me working out and he's just like, I love it. And then I'll get a picture of him working out. <laughs> the other day he broke his rule of not touching his phone so that he could text me to come over and work out. And it was just like, like a random, like Tuesday or Wednesday morning. And it was like, probably 6 45 7 in the morning it's like yo you want to lift i was like i wasn't gonna do anything that day or i was kind of like kicking the bus delaying i should say i was like ah, i wasn't going to i'll be over in 15 minutes <laughs> <laughs> and he guy come over there and he's like cool i just gotta eat breakfast and he's like i broke my rules morning i normally don't touch my phone for an hour after i wake up but he's like i really wanted to lift today but i didn't want to but i needed somebody here to make me <laughs> So I broke my rule and text you because I knew you would make me. And I was like, I didn't want to lift today. And he's like, I'm glad we're here. <laughs> like, yeah. so then we just awkward. bust out a garage session on or about our day. And that's so anyways, back to e-bikes. It's like, I, that's, I have to keep up with those dudes. If I want to go ride with my friends, I have to ride my e-bike, unfortunately right now. <laughs> but it's also got me stronger. Like I, when I first got one, I did every other day. So I do my e-bike. I'd ride like, I think I did like three or four weeks and I just tried to ride like four or five days a week and I just alternate. Mm-hmm. And then I went like a week on just like my regular bike. And I was like, holy crap. Part of it obviously was like riding that volume and that amount of time, of mm-hmm. seat time. But I was like, holy crap. I don't think I've ever felt this strong on a bike on climbs and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I highly encourage anybody to do it. And well, like racing, w- like absolutely go for it. I think they're harder to race mm-hmm. personally. Yeah. Yeah, because it kind of chop out at a point, but like 
riding with your friends if they're that much faster like at what point do you start modding e-bikes like for just for yourself i would love to i don't know how be sick yeah absolutely like, oh, can we get look, an look open at you guys class? now look at you now look yeah. at you maybe do get turbos <laughs> open class Let's get yeah. exhaust on these things, yeah, it's... cooling fans, whatever we got to do. Soup the these things up, dude. Underglow. Absolutely. Yeah, I was just about to say lights. If there's any Apple engineers out there that have any familiarity with these electric I'll engines? Think you the Hit me up. Out on the wheel because it like it's calibrated off of like where it's supposed I, to be on the rotor. I've heard all if these. You move it out. I've heard all these tricks. I've never actually done well, the motor them. Probably just start spitting. Smoke and I've out. heard people try them and say no, they they don't work or. They only worked on this older model. Now they fixed the firmware yeah, probably, where it doesn't yeah. do that anymore. So, Dang. yeah, I don't know. But honestly, I think they're intense. harder. Like I've I've done pre-running for Enduros and stuff like that. I go pre-run all the courses on the e-bike. Mm -hmm. And then your times are actually faster on your regular bike. Because mm -hmm. it's just Crazy. a little bit lighter and then a little bit more efficient. You're not tapping out and then pushing a motor. Yeah. But topping out like 20 miles an hour where it's like on your other bike, you'd be going 25, 30 miles an hour pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're just not being held back. So there's been jumps on, on tracks that I've been pre-riding where I'm like, Rick, I'm like sprinting in, maxing this motor out and pulling. Thing. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do this on my trail bike. Like, geez, like it's just a little trail gap, like nothing crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you ride your regular bike. <laughs> you're like overshooting, <laughs> blowing a turn. You're like, what? <laughs> That was so easy. Someone took the choke off. Yeah, somebody took the choke off. Put race gas in. <laughs> got more questions? I think that's all we got for, for John. We got some for Charlie. I, um, hold on. I have, a, I have a dumb guy question about e-bike racing. If we can just... Mm -hmm. How does travel work with lithium-ion batteries? We don't travel with e-bikes. I've never done it, so I don't know. I do... I think what they do is they ship them ahead. Uh-huh. And there's like a hazmat cert that you have to do and you have to ship them a certain way. I do know because I can tense like I've worked with a shipping dude over there. There's like one guy and he's got to ship batteries and hazmat materials and stuff. So there's like a hazmat certification that whoever the shipper is has to have. And then it's like a special box and then all these labels on there. And yeah. then if it's going to another country, like all the label, like it's a gnarly thing to ship a battery, but yeah, they basically just get shipped a certain through a certain protocol. So if Joe or Jane Doe want to go race, some e-bike race mm -hmm. in Europe, they have to like... It's got to be in a separate box properly labeled, I'm pretty sure, it's dependent yeah. upon the country. Yep. Yeah. And then, so, yeah, it can't be like in the bike box. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then make sure all your custom stuff is in order so that you get it. Now, aren't there some that are like, I don't want to say universal batteries, but some of the batteries are just like, they're yeah. the same. They'll like they'll fit any bike. <laughs> Everyone over here, you can't see, they're just like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. No. Like, this is all legend. <laughs> We work in the industry. You think we right. know, but you know. <laughs> I we just write the I battery that comes with have batteries. It's <laughs> yeah, not about yeah, what is battery. It. it just yeah. has battery. <laughs> so, like what we do for the team, like we have all e-bikes on the racetrack over there. They're super efficient to get back and forth from the track. Um, they're great training tools and stuff like that. So we just got uh, from our European distributor mm -hmm. e-bikes. So they're just there waiting they're for you. They're just there waiting yeah. for us. So we didn't have to ship any of them. I think but, you're right with the batteries, though. There are like some universal ones. Yeah, where you can like, just fly with your bike and then go to a bike shop or rent a battery or something mm -hmm. like that. Like if it's like a vacation uh, type deal. Uh -huh. I think. Don't call me. Yeah, on. I don't know if bike shops would do that, but that would be a good idea. Yeah. Like riding destinations. Business idea. You're that welcome. That's yeah. got to be a thing yeah. in, in spots where people are doing that. For sure. Yeah. I didn't see any. Are people in our DMs? <clears throat> What was the question not, for not Charlie? For this, but yeah, they're definitely in there. Um, yeah, there's other ones for Charlie. Let's see. Uh, see, internet famous dude. Is Team Robot <laughs> going to make an appearance at the Underworld Cup Rebirth? Oh, oh. I wish. That's April. I want to say. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, there's any way that's yeah, going to happen. But is that a P Pacific yeah. Northwest thing? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and so. MW Cup chimed in that you can't. Pretty sure you're banned. <laughs> So, uh, substance <laughs> so, was, you, was it was you no, just, involved? Just the substance of what I say. Just like you're, I don't want you around here anymore. Yeah, you probably said some pretty controversial stuff to like ruffled feathers through the industry, haven't you? A couple of times, yeah. I think that's that what you're known for, is yeah. it not? <laughs> so, does, does that ever like keep you from? Saying what you want to say? Uh, no, not really. Like, are you affiliated in any way where you kind of have to watch what you want so, to say? I don't want to hurt people's feelings, Fair. right? But like, this is new, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what about in the yeah. early days? So we covered we covered yeah the development of self awareness, but uh, 
I currently don't want to hurt people's feelings. Um, but yeah, in terms of like, if something sucks, it should be, yeah, we should, should talk be known. about that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And also why does everything have to be great all the time? Like, yeah, yeah. I can get behind that. If you're trying to develop a product, mm-hmm. you should be very open about the fact that like, oh, here's some things we tried along the way and this yeah. didn't work and that didn't work. And so the fact that everything just be awesome from start to finish. Yeah. We or- got to write the first time and it's mm-hmm. the sickest thing you've ever written <clears throat> and you'll never write anything better. Yeah. Or yeah. even like, to use an example, Specialized mm-hmm. makes high-end road bikes, they make triathlon bikes, they make commuter bikes, they make downhill bikes, cross-country bikes, they make everything in between. It's like all of them are perfect. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like you're going to tell me you make all and 10,000 well, shoes they and they none might, of them suck? They might be <laughs> for a percentage of people. Like each one. There's going to be somebody who's like, this thing is just right for me. Yeah. I think that's where like a lot of that comes from where like people will be like, why doesn't this brand just make this this way? Because Mm -hmm. they rode something from somebody else that was perfect for them, but this other brand doesn't do it that way. And now they're like, this brand sucks. Like, no, they just don't offer you something that Mm -hmm. you would prefer. Mm -hmm. I'm like, we're in a pretty good spot where we have a lot of choices. Mm -hmm. And so like kind of to your point, like, why does everything have to be perfect? Or why does everything like not have to suck? Like if it if you don't like it, there's a lot of other choices out there. Yeah. And it and it probably is really great for a lot of other people. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. who really love it. So Well, it's like you guys are exploring, like you said, every option to make it one hundred percent just like one thing sick, but mm-hmm. everything and for the consumer that's gonna relate to like, yeah, of course you're gonna like it. Works for the best racers in the world. Yeah, yeah it's not just for them. Like yeah. Feels pretty good for everyone too. Yeah, absolutely. That's I that's one thing like I've learned from Aaron along the ways. Like I didn't just jump into like development roles or people respecting my opinion. Like I very much sat in the shadows for a long time and just learned and watched and a lot from Aaron. And he always had the end consumer in mind, or hmm. always does. Like and that's that's his sometimes it's been his battle with some brands like in the past and stuff or, or development project along the way or something like that has been like, they're like, okay, yeah, we'll make that for you, but we're going to make it like this for the customer or for production. And it's like, no, no, like I am asking for it like that because it's sick. And if it's sick, it will be sick for the customer too. Like I promise you just do it. You don't have to make two versions. You don't have to make me a special version. Like, Mm -hmm. like, I'm making it sick for everybody. Yeah, Trust that, me. That is you know a letdown I mean? when you like buy a bike and you're like, oh, there's like this weird thing it does. And then you look and you're like, oh, there's a polished aluminum link on the World Cup bike. <laughs> yeah. Every team rider yeah. has a different link well, or like a different triangle. So that's a little bit different, right? Well, I guess you there's do have like, to provide those guys that opportunity where for sure. you can to give them the best opportunity to but win. But if you never see someone on a production one, you're just kind of like, all right, well, there's inherently something different and it right. could be like... Yep. And that's you know, the double-edged sword, right? There's... Yeah. Like you want to give everybody that, but like do you want to open that up for every consumer to build every consumer a custom link. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't do that. That's true. But it's like, you can still make it really good. Like it's really good, but just understand that because he has a, a CNC custom polished link or something like that, it's not because he likes his link polished. It's just because he has a very specific need or request Mm -hmm. for him personally. Mm -hmm. And and he's in a position to ask for that. And we're in a position to provide it or we as in a brand, not us specifically. Do you have a example in the past of something that, Aaron was super hyped on for himself as well as consumers that we saw come into production at some point. Um, pool. I mean, yeah, for sure. There's, well, there's been a ton. Mm-hmm. Um, his I mean, grips, like, an example. like his grips uh-huh. are one, like his grips are super popular. The AG twos. Mm-hmm. Um, like he's legitimately like loves those grips. He's tried other grips, been like through hand injuries, thumb injuries, stuff like that. Like, Oh, maybe I try something a little more padding or something like that. And he's like, Nope. Still like mine. Like mm-hmm. these are sick. Um, he's really good at tire development. And the tires back on this bike right now are like a product of that that will be available to the consumers. They mm-hmm. are the same ones that we're going to be racing will be available to the consumers. The casing, the compound, everything. And he's like genuinely stoked on these things. Mm-hmm. And we it took us all year long to, mm-hmm. to go through those growing pains and develop it and find the winning combo and like got it sick and v was like he's like just just please listen and like this is what i want and then when we got to that point and he got what and then they listened and this was the product he's like yes 
Thank you. And like, this is going to be a sick tire for the public. I don't know when it's coming out. Um, everybody's seen pictures of the prototypes all year long, part of the mm-hmm. development, stuff like that. But I'm pretty sure the ones that are on the bike are like their production level, ready to go. Like they're firing up the machine. So I would imagine at some point this season, they're going to be available for purchase. Um, so examples like that, it's yeah. stuff, tires. Like, what about the brakes we all commented on? Oh yeah, absolutely. The TRP brakes. I mean, dude, yeah. I see those brakes everywhere. Mm-hmm. like bike parks and dad's putting them on the kids bikes and they're on their bikes and they're on e-bikes. And it's like, he had a huge development in that. <clears throat> we took a, um, we could say now like took a big risk on TRP switching to them. Like almost, I don't think I'd ever heard of them. It's one of those things where I was yeah. legitimately like, mm, dude, no, when he went to <laughs> Onza on tires, he went to Onza tires and TRP brakes. Mm-hmm. And I remember going, 13 and then he won the <clears throat> overall that year. Yeah. Won, on, the first, won the first race. On Anza tires. Yeah. Like not. The ones he developed. <laughs> yeah, yep. for sure. They were really good. I remember seeing that press release mm-hmm. and being like, okay, yeah. Somebody's mm-hmm. got to make a down payment on a house. But yep. it was like, no, actually, <laughs> no, they were. Nailed it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And But see, that's like, he lines himself with brands who are like, okay, we'll listen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, tell us what to do. And he's like, good. Here. And it was like, brakes. It was like, we got the first set of brakes. And it was like, okay, like, pretty good. Um can we change things? And they're like, absolutely. That's why we hired you. Like, Hmm. what do you want out of a break? How do you want it to feel? This, and he goes, well, this, that, and the other, I like this, but I don't like this. And then it was like, okay, here's this version. All right. Yep. Better proved on that. Good, better, worse. Here's what's better. Here's what's worse. Here's keep this disregard that. Cool. Here's the next one. Sweet. Dude, these things are sick. And then it was like a little bit more refinement. And it's like, boom, here they are. And it's, they're free. I don't know when it breaks of the year and they're legitimate. Like, it's not just sitting here doing sponsor plugs and stuff like that. It's like we're literally well, aligning yeah. ourselves with products that I I would no joke if I wasn't sponsored by them I'd be buying these brakes. I mean they would be on my yeah, on my bike. At that point he'd ridden for Shimano and for SRAM mm-hmm. and obviously figured out what he liked about each one. So that's where it was kind of like he just knows what he needs. Despite winning out of the, the first race, it was like well yeah I mean that guy probably if you have a blank slate to yeah. go and create something you probably know between the two major brands everybody buys like how to pick what you like and don't like. Yep. And then so. you just need somebody that will execute on it. And <clears throat> Kirby said, sure. And then they did it. Sick. I was like, yes, thank you. Yeah. And it, it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. And so that's the other part of the thing is he's real patient with it. Mm-hmm. You know, he'd be like, okay, I'll work with you. Like, we're going to get through this. There'll be growing pains, ups and downs, but let's do it. Like mm-hmm. we're committed. And then when that happens and that relationship stays and it's able to like live it out and it's like, dude, there it is. It's a sick product. So, and it's like not sitting here taking full credit, single handedly made these breaks. Like there's a lot of input from a lot of athletes and teams and stuff. But originally like, dude, it was me, him and this dude, Dave Beeler, who's still at TRP, but I think he's on like the sales side and stuff like that. And it was like me and Aaron at the top of the world in Laguna. And like this dude, Dave just showed up. I was like, what's up, I'm Dave? Here's these breaks. <laughs> <laughs> what's up, Dave? Sick. Nice to meet you. Like anything I need to know before I put these things on? He's like, no, nope, I'll be right here. Just slap them on, bleed them like any other ones. Here's everything. He's just there to make sure everything went right and did and then grew from there. Now we have uh, Colin Escobel over there and I work, he lives right near Intense and stuff. So him and I are still on the drivetrain stuff, like work very closely together on all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, continue to work on brakes, uh, brake pads, brake rotors, different designs, thicknesses, materials, like the, it's never ending. Like mm-hmm. I kind of forget until I sit down and actually talk about it. I'm like literally just, right now having like the epiphany of like, Oh crap. I'm like working a lot of stuff right now <laughs> and not sitting here like personally, like working on all of it. It's like, oh, I got to get back, provide this <clears throat> feedback, mm-hmm. remind me to talk to this guy about that. Let them know about this issue. Let them know that this part was sick. And it's like, you just give all that. And when they listen, dude, it's so good. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. It's really fun. Now I'm going to push back a little bit on something you said earlier, sure. which was, we were talking about links. And having custom links and polished yep. links. And you're like, well, obviously can't, Intents can't have, you know, can't sell like four different links, but yep. they could, right? The challenge isn't, because you're talking about product development mm-hmm. for your racers where they're testing different product configurations and like more progressive, less progressive, different mm-hmm. tracks, those sorts of things. But then it becomes a marketing problem of like, how do I communicate the different performance of these different links, which is pretty like, 
black belt kung fu hard sometimes right? yeah for sure to communicate to potentially a very beginner level mm-hmm. customer you don't want to confuse them like to your point yeah right? so you could for right sure. like coil springs right we mm-hmm. sell a million different coil springs and we've been able to overcome the marketing burden of explaining how to set up suspension right mm-hmm. like oh you might need to test this or that and like you can have you can sell wider bars you can sell skinnier bars you can tell people to cut down wider bars you know stem length there's a million different things you can configure it's just uh for bike companies at this point that isn't the route they've chosen to go for like selling a better bike to a customer right so it's a fine line like you have to you'll never make everybody happy Mm-hmm. no matter what it is uh, bar stem grip like whatever i'm never happy yeah yeah <laughs> yeah dude and sometimes athletes are like never happy either like and it's but that's what drives like progression and development so as frustrating as it sometimes can be to hear that information like you just gotta take it and be mm-hmm. like okay how do we fix it or change it or make it better or not whatever the case um but to your point i think everything's a balance everything's on a spectrum and you do your best to to be in the right area of that spectrum no matter what it is so let's just use bikes and frames so and these are opinions but it's if you give let's say i don't want to just pick on customers or consumers because i am also a consumer but if you give people every option under the book I'm going to send you three different angles. When you buy a bike, I'm going to send you three different angle sets, straight up one, one down, a slack one, and a steep one. And then I'm going to send, then the bike is going to come with a flip chip that has a high and a low bottom bracket position. And then I'm going to give you three different shock positions. One's super progressive. One's right in the middle. One's super linear. And then I'm going to give you three different rear end options. Chain sailing. Chain sailing. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Dude, Charlie you want to know. Start. Charlie, yeah, right? We're right. We're so getting. here's the thing. Yeah, I actually he, drooled just a little yeah. bit when and you so, were describing but, that. But yeah. here's the thing. No, yeah. uh, going back to the spectrum, you guys are on the higher end of that mm-hmm. spectrum, right? You you know the difference. You know how to set all that. Kind Charlie's of stuff on up. the spectrum. <laughs> right? No, not that spectrum. <laughs> but it's like you have the knowledge or the thought process to be like, okay, when I change this, it also affects all of these other things. I need to take uh-huh. this into consideration and change them one at a time and like one at a time. same trail you know over, the process, over again. Right? Yeah. You give that to an average to below average consumer and they're like, this is sick. I'm buying this bike. Two things are going to happen. He's either going to set that bike up. He, she, they're going to set that bike up completely wrong and be like, this bike sucks. sucks. <laughs> it has all, all these features and they still didn't get it right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or he's going to pull it out of the box and go right and be like, sweet. And never touch any of those options. He's going to be mm-hmm. right in the middle and never touch it. So what do you do? That's the age old question. Like how much do you really offer the consumer? Who are you building it for? Mm-hmm. What's your market? What kind of, is it a downhill bike or is it a cross country bike? Cross country bike doesn't need all of that. You're not going to put all those features on cross country bike. Downhill bike, like it would make sense. It would be really hard yeah, to you make need, like a guide. Like you would need some type of fault, like a right. mud, like a dirt bike owner's and manual somebody tells you. to understand it. And then even for yourself, how often would you change it once you got it dialed in? Yeah. Oh yeah. Probably never. Never or or when very you minimal. Travel when you travel and you're in some weird new setting. You're yeah, like, you're going oh, well, to a Earth. race. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Something like that, right? Yeah. So what do you do? Like, uh-huh. do you risk giving people all these options and them having a bad experience on your bike, which would be terrible? You want that, or do you satisfy? Let's say it's a minority group, mm-hmm. like people like yourself, to like satisfy that small group of people. You try to find somewhere in the middle. You try to keep, <clears throat> give just enough adjustment to the people who want it, mm-hmm. but you don't put so much adjustment in it that the person who doesn't know what he's doing is going to mess the bike up and have a bad experience. The ultimate goal, regardless of what you choose to do, is to make sure that whoever's riding your bike is having the time of their life and having fun on it. Like that doesn't matter. So if that means like you just need to offer a chain stay length mm-hmm. and, and that's going to give enough adjustment to anybody to make some adjustment, but not screw anything up so that the bike 
rides the way it's supposed to. And that's the other thing too, is like you talk to an engineer, he's like, most of them will say, well, I've designed the bike to work like this. If I give you the options to change all these things, it will no longer ride as designed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like even changing chain stay length is changing the leverage rate on the shock Mm -hmm. and thus damping is different and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, um, so it's just finding that balance. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, yep. You can push back on it. And definitely there are, I know I would want options, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you're second in the running at Fontana. Yeah, right now. absolutely. Yeah. You know, you I just need can't to, leave any stone unturned. I just can't find that half second that I need. <laughs> and I think if I had more options, yeah, mm-hmm. I could do it. Yeah. But it goes you get back. that race link on there <laughs> yeah. all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know. To, to I don't know if there was a question in that, but it was. Um, yeah, you obviously want to give everybody who wants the options the options, but you you don't want to give them the option to mess it up either. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, to your and point. it's not like a high horse thing of like mightier than thou. We know more than whoever's going to ride our bike type of thing. It's just like the end goal you want. I think any brand could vouch for it. Like you just want people to have fun on your bike. Mm-hmm. You want them to have an enjoyable experience and good customer service when they need it and the bike to last and have fun on. You know what I mean? Like that's all. I, I mm-hmm. love that out of a bike. And yeah. that meant that I only got to change my rear end length and that's all i needed the bike's still sick it's mm-hmm. fun. Yeah. i don't need to change anything else i guess well, yeah i had a bike with a ton of adjustment like that and to your point like tried every setting where there's six different ways you could set it up and i ended up right back where they shipped it yeah and i was like it felt the best right there yeah couldn't have even touched it but at least i know now yeah mm-hmm. and so those are just thought experiences yeah or thought experience like thought experiments you know yeah. what i mean like you you got to go scratch that itch, but now yeah. you know. And I was like, oh, okay. So like we try to iron way. all that out in the development process. You know what I mean? Like you, and like, you'll see some people's mules that are super, um, archaic, you know, but they have a ton of adjustment on one bike. So that's them sorting out a, what's working best, what combination of all these adjustments work best and whether their end goal is like, we're not allowing any adjustments for our consumers. We're going to sort it all out now with this bike and then just go to production with it or hey like uh we found it really beneficial that it has a high and low position let's let's leave that on there Mm -hmm. but let's not give them a rear end length adjustment because maybe this bike or this suspension design works very specifically well because of the leverage ratio yeah and if you change the rear end length then that's going to affect what the leverage ratio is going to affect how the bike rides don't do that don't give them that option like type of thing well, and we're like way, way into the rabbit hole here 100%. where when you're talking about, oh, a bike that doesn't come with any adjustments, it's like, well, actually it comes in four different sizes. You can uh-huh. adjust tire pressure and suspension setup, right? Yep. So there are, <clears throat> there are already a million ways where the average customer can make the bike feel terrible. We could, I was going to say, right? we could draw it back even just a step farther away from options to adjust things. And I think I had this conversation today with Tanner. Mm-hmm. And it was like we were um so JP was putting some laps in on the bike today. He's like, Man, this thing is just stiff. I was like, Yeah, man, I told you I had it set up for me. I'm, I'm 220, I'm a big dude, and he's like 160 with gear. And he kept going like a little bit softer. And it was like a little bit of the track. Um track's pretty flat, some steep sections, but real rough and chunky. Double peak. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It'll beat you up. Right. So you tend to go a bit softer there. And once he got it, he's like, dude there it is. Like once you got everything dialed in and it like sparked a thought, I'm like, how many people have the incorrect setup on their bike and are like, this bike, this bike sucks, sucks mm-hmm. where I was like, if you just give uh, me or anybody else who kind of knows what they're doing with some of the setup and be like, well, okay, dude, your levers are vertical. Let's raise them up a little bit. Cause your arms are probably exhausted. Mm-hmm. Your wrist probably hurt really bad. Um, let's check your sag. Oh, you have, 11% in the front and uh, 69% sag in the rear. That's not great, brother. <laughs> We're sacked out. You know what I mean? Like, let's even it out. Does not where is, like, does your, <laughs> does your suspension have any settings and where are they? Like, oh my gosh, um, mm-hmm. your rebound is set all the way open. Like, that can't be good. Like, let's, and then all of a sudden, the amount of people that it's like, what's your tire pressure? Like, I have no idea. Mm-hmm. I pumped it up when I got it. It's, it's like, okay. Dude, hanging out at the Fox booth for an hour at Sea Otter, the mm-hmm. most common question was like, oh, it's just, you know, the bike's doing this or it's doing this. What's your sag at? Oh, I don't know. It's just doing this weird thing. And yeah. it's like, well, yeah, the weird thing is that it's nowhere near where it's supposed to be. <laughs> right. Well, one like, of the best things is working at a commuter shop 
for mm-hmm. commuter bikes, right? And you just have to reset your whole brain of like how people <laughs> even think about bicycles. Sure. Where they're describing something they feel and you're like, what's your tire pressure? And they go, what do you mean? Right. And exactly. you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. How do you inflate these tires? And they've got like the basketball pump or something, <laughs> yep. right? And they're like, I don't know. It felt pretty firm. Yeah. And you like push it and you just watch the rim bottom out. Yeah. And you're like, okay, yep. we're going to educate you. Well, this you. is great basketball pressure. It's not great for tires. <laughs> we're so, going to educate you about, right? Yeah. So and it is a very large spectrum. So to that infinite. point, like how many people have made decisions on a bike based off of incorrect setups? Dude, I think about that with reviews all the time. Like, like if it's a review of a bike with a you. coil shock, mm-hmm. just you. instantly, I'm like, you're just reviewing the coil rate you had on the shock. Yeah. Right? If yeah. the shock's too stiff, you're going to be like, oh, well, it felt really like divey and party. Yeah. Yeah. It felt really harsh and like, oh, the front end really packed up a lot. It's because the rear end is just driving the fork down. And it's like, oh, it felt really like or slow versa. and sluggish. Yeah, and it's like, how many spring rates did yeah. you try? Right? 45 millimeters of spacers under your stem. Like, yeah. What are you doing? Mm-hmm. That's Dakota. Or if you're tanner on yeah, top of the stem. a little bit different. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> like, it takes me three, four months before I like the bike. Like, new Dude. bike day is the worst day in the world for me. So, I'm like, this is horrible. To the point, God. like, and <laughs> Why, I was going to say, to, yeah. to your point, like, I, I'm also, a, uh, I've fallen victim to that, too, of, like, just getting lazy in your rides or your setup and, like, been riding my setup for a while like haven't checked my suspension pressures in a few <laughs> weeks or something like that and like you're just grabbing your bike off the wall topping on it going for your ride and then pretty soon you're like man something doesn't feel right right now <laughs> and i'm like oh like i haven't checked my suspension pressures in a while and i think i only check my tire pressure every four rides like i need to be a little bit better about that and then you set it, go through a little reset set everything mm-hmm. back up and you're like yes this bike's sick mm-hmm. you're like oh yeah, yeah. like I got to remember to stay on top of that thing. So mm-hmm. I'd say like, got to be better about educating about that. Mm-hmm. Even like very skilled people like remind them like, Hey, don't forget to check your suspension pressures, mm-hmm. you know, play with settings if it doesn't mm-hmm. feel good. And if you have any questions, please reach out. Don't mm-hmm. just go to your buddies who also don't know what they're talking about. It's almost like it needs to be in an email or something or like an Instagram post. It's like message to the consumers. I feel like in the manual just gets thrown away on day one. Like I've worked on customers' bikes mm-hmm. where they're like, oh, my e-, you know, my seat post battery died. Or, you know, I'd, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's the batteries that, no, the bike's plugged in. And I'm like, no, but it's, the seat post has a battery. And they're like, no, no, but I plugged in the bike. And I'm like, yeah, but the charger for the seat post battery was in the box of the manual. Oh, I threw all that away. Okay, well, new charger 60 bucks. And they're yeah. like, well, why? And I'm like, it's plugged in. I'm like, it's just... Yep. It's not plugged in. <laughs> yeah. We're missing, like that we're missing type of step stuff. two yeah. of yeah. four just here, like, you know? <laughs> but, and part of that's just like education. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? There needs to be like a sticker on the shock or something. Like, do not ride this bike. It's hard. Until but that's, this. that's the whole game, right? Is we're not talking about product development here. We're talking about marketing. Setup. Yep. Because or, well, educating a customer is its own battle. And so mm-hmm. we've essentially gotten to a balancing point in bike industry, in the bike industry where we go, okay, we trust the average customer to sort of roughly figure out spring pressure on an air fork and air shock yeah and beyond that and like set up a small range of like stem spacers right and pick a frame size yeah and once you go outside of that you're wandering into uncharted territory and you have to do a lot of additional work with a customer you have to have like a really strong sales pitch Uh, i mean what's the like the nails on a chalkboard question is can you give me some suspension settings (laughs) or (laughs) what what so pressure? Sense. What pressure do I put in the shock? A lot. Uh, like, <laughs> okay. How many spacers you got in there? What? Okay. Mm. Um, how, like, you, it's like oh, I weigh one hundred and sixty. Well, that means nothing to me. Like, <laughs> I, what bike are you on? What's the leverage ratio? That's the same question. Like, there's so many factors. If you really want to truly like get into it, it's like, dude, there's a lot. So it, it just goes back to education. Like, mm-hmm. let's keep it. It's tough. Like it's been fragmented. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's easier at a shop level because you can tell how, the customer like it is not going to do the thing if you don't do this thing. Well, but I mean, at a shop there, level, I'm not saying everybody has to do this, but maybe we start there when a customer buys a bike. Mm-hmm. You got to make sure that your staff is educated in this, right? First, yeah. right? Otherwise, they'll mess it up. But get your staff educated, and then when a customer buys a bike, you go through the setup process and you and you say try that. And I'm going to write it down for you. Here you go. 
hang on to that and let me know how it feels. Now, most people are going to be like, okay, cool. See you. And then not come back. Some people will come back and be like, I tried that setting, but it feels like this. Okay. Let's change this and try that and like get you help you like to mm-hmm. dial that in. And I think everybody brands and shops all try to do that. I'm not saying nobody does. Um, mm-hmm. I know, man, the amount of videos that intense puts out on mm-hmm. here's how you build your bike out of the box. If you want to pack your, save your box and go on a trip, here's how you pack this bike back up to the point of like, it's not just a random bike. You can find that video for every model in every size. Like I bought a large tracer two, seven, nine. There's a build video for it and a pack video for it and how to adjust my suspension mm-hmm. and how to set it up and like all that kind of stuff. And it's like, I mean, you can only do so much and put it out there and promote it. But yeah. They're bringing some like the calculator on their website. Mm-hmm. Same mm-hmm. thing with like the geometry adjustment. You can go on there and kind of punch in like what you want to do with it. Right. It gives you yeah. a recommendation and that's so much more important than just being like, you know, yep. you need a shock pump. But yeah. a customer has to know mm-hmm. where to find that and what it means. Mm-hmm. It's very hard. Know what they want. Yeah. Like there is it's a taken me years standard mm-hmm. years. And like, I mean, Charlie and I have a conversation earlier of like the, the classic, uh, saying of like, I, I never want to be the smartest person in the, in the room. I want to be the dumbest person in the room wondering how in the world did I get in on this conversation? And can you teach me everything? you know? like it's, yeah, it is more of that. Like, and, um, what's the word? Not humility, but you have to put your ego away and say, I don't know how to do this. Like the trouble with that is that a lot of bike sales are literally pitching directly to someone's ego. Right. right. Like you're True. literally going, here's yeah. the newest, coolest, here's the nicest, shiniest, lightest, fastest, this. most you efficient. You will be better. Yeah. Buy yeah. this and then go show up to a shop and admit you don't know anything. Right. <laughs> right. It's like, that's a pretty <laughs> tough. And it's tough, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's like the classic. Um, I, I never ask anybody who just bought a new bike how they like it. Mm. It's the best thing ever. No. Because, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's the best bike ever. This thing is mm. sick. I love this. I can't believe I rode whatever I was riding. Like, I'm going to come find that in six months. Yeah. Have that same energy. Now tell me, <laughs> yeah. how do you like this bike? And how often have you ridden it? Oh, man. Friggin' been having trouble with this and this and that. And mm-hmm. It's like, see? There we go. It's that new bike stoke. Um, it, but it's just to your point of the ego. Like, mm-hmm. and being able to admit, like, I don't know anything about this. Or maybe, like, you do know, like, hey, I know a little bit about suspension. I know I need to set my sag. But... I didn't know that because a bike has a different leverage ratio, which I also just learned about, uh, also affects what my sag is going to be. Your and the knobs relate to the sag. And some bike companies are like, we, we need you to run 35% sag. And mm-hmm. then some companies are like, we need you to be in the 20 to 25% sag. And then mm-hmm. you have the amount of people that don't know how to do the math on to figure out a percentage. And they're like, how do I know what 25% is? Right. And you're like, but fair question, because how many shock sizes are out there? Well, and how and many stroke, shocks have a stroke written on the stand? Stroke or and yeah, stroke lips, anywhere on you know the mean? shock? Like because they'll go, oh, well, like I want twenty five percent. I have two bikes, mm-hmm. and that bike has a sixty five or a sixty stroke, and that one has a seventy five, and twenty five percent or whatever on the seventy five stroke is eighteen millimeters, and I'm gonna put eighteen millimeters on my sixty one. Well, mm-hmm. That's I remember not the same. Downhill days, I remember having my mom get a ruler out to measure mm-hmm. the coil shock, right? Because yeah. it didn't have an O ring. Yeah. So you're like, uh <laughs> measure eye to eye. And then Mom, I'm in a balance against the garage door. Can <laughs> yeah. you you're doing millimeters, mom. Yeah, we yeah. Millimeters. Yeah. do some millimeters. Yeah. Like, Metric. It's easier, I swear. <laughs> She's like, is that seven eighths? Is that seven sixteenths? I'm like, yeah. millimeters, mom. Make this the so other much side. Harder. <laughs> yeah, flip it over. Yeah, that's a spoke ruler. That's incredible. <laughs> oh yeah. my god. So, uh, did it? Uh, I mean, it's not a battle we're going to solve right now. We'll, we'll get there. <laughs> um, but it's it's going back to the spectrum of customers and mm-hmm. products and stuff like that. You have the guys who are that detailed and they know it and sometimes know it better than anybody. And then there's people who are like, this is my first bike. My neighbors told me this is the one I should get. And a, and a bike shop dude's like sick, mm-hmm. easy sell. Here you go. That's whatever bike you bought three grand and out the door. Have a great day. Like you get a free tune up in 30 days, by the mm-hmm. way, bring it back. Like there's that. Also, too. if you want to flex on your neighbor, there's an S works version. Yeah, yeah. Like, exactly. You know, I'm just like, <laughs> Yeah, you want to come back with something cooler? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the baller version. But um, yeah, it's just going to take education and trying to help people understand it. 
Mm-hmm. It's tough though. Like how do you, a dude's like, Hey, how do I set my suspension well, up? And you're like at the trailhead and you're like, Oh, <laughs> how far do I go? That's a big yeah, question. Where do well, I I'm start? fascinated too by like, if someone goes out and buys a brand new like KTM 450, they're not going to go to the track and ride it with stock suspension nine times out of 10. Like if they know what they're buying, do they? they're going to go get the sure? suspension. That's what I'm going to do. Well, I feel, like, <laughs> I feel like a lot of people would go and get the suspension valve. Like if they're going to take, if they're a decent seriously. rider, more likely, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah or if they're, they're racing, or yeah, I guess. But it's more so for racing. Not but a dude like, who's buying his very first dirt bike, no, you're you're, you're totally correct. There. He's just taking that but thing. When you look at it compared to, oh, totally. to like ninety percent of mountain bikers that would go and race a bike with stock suspension without doing any type of setup, like you would die on a dirt bike <laughs> yeah. racing at any type of like level, you know. But our stuff is so good now, too. To mm-hmm. that point, like that's true. I can pull a stock forty. Mm-hmm. And an X2 oh, yeah, yeah, out of totally. the box, put it on my bike. And I'm not saying you get settings, your suspension and I'm like, like it's going to be sick. But like just to go through the setup process, like they would go sure. to a shop more than likely and be like, hey, can you set this up for me instead of just being like, I'm going to wing it. Or they have a owner's manual that goes in depth enough to mm-hmm. make them feel confident for like, is this type of track? It's going to get me to this setting and it should work well. Where as a mountain bike, it's like, what do you mean it's not going to work all the time? Yeah. You know, what do you mean you have to check the pressure? Yeah, mm-hmm. so exactly. That's, it's hard to compare those worlds too. I'm yeah, very, I know it's I'm not very a guilty of it. But, yeah. I'm very like, but Moto does it like this, and I'm like, ah, it's just it's not, not the same. same. <laughs> but there's relations, there's e-bikes connections. A little closer, but, it's like yeah. a way it works. I feel like, but yeah. I would wager the majority of dirt bikes out there in the world are running stock suspension that has never been serviced. <laughs> a lot. There's a lot right? out there. Like how many 96 CR 20, 125s are out there yeah. that still kicking need a, need a top end. <laughs> yes, <bad. it's> about- <laughs> While the dirt bike in my garage is one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not racing it at a high level. Uh, can I go to the bathroom? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't uh, want to talk like to you anyway. Anybody who uh, clicks on the video that's John Hall intense factory racing is going to assume all we do is talk about the new bike. Mm-hmm. For sure. They will be sorely We're disappointed. We're talking about is that how we, he's not here. Is yeah. that what we... Uh, so we'll finish this. Okay, so here's a fun question. What can we say about this bike? Well, yeah. No, I like. I can say well, that I got a magnet out, and I can confirm that the frame is not made of steel. do have <laughs> questions for Charlie yeah. still, so... We can what are we at, two hours already? Do you were. It's irrelevant. Uh... <laughs> I know. I just took also, it. John's just I wasn't so saying interesting. A lot earlier. All right, Charlie. <laughs> from an old team robot post, you can't scrub. Here we go. Is there a question, or is that just? <laughs> it's it's. My buddy Evan Ames wants to know. You can't scrub. Let Charlie go off on that. Mikey was the king. <laughs> Let Charlie go off on that. Okay, yeah. so it's just. Free here's Netflix something you was said. a good one too. Is that even still a thing? <laughs> here's something Charlie said. Have him complain about it for a while. Yeah, uh, I mean, the basic theme here is that, yeah, the word scrub is... And you might notice the theme in general that I'm pretty particular about word usage, but... Yeah, yeah, so we covered... That's the next question. Yeah, there's another one, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, we covered loam pretty extensively. That's the topic Uh of the second question. But uh, (laughs) but the question right now is scrubbing, Mm -hmm. which is just another wildly misappropriated word that comes from motorcycles and it sounds like you're using some sort of special industry speak like oh it's i i he's scrubbing right he's going low on the jump but there was already a word for that it's called squashing if you're mm. squashing a jump you're just staying low right which is what everyone does when you just absorb the bump and scrubbing is a very specific thing that to evan's point mikey sylvester can do i've seen aaron gwynn do it ellie jackson can do it mitch Ropolato can do it and you can't I most people, certainly, to most people, yeah. I'm not I, saying you, but well, I'm like nine feet can't. tall, and I've got yeah. a mean squash game, and I can't even remotely get close to scrubbing. Nor do I want to. And you can yeah. tell someone is actually scrubbing when every like twentieth time they do it, they like wildly eat shit, <clears throat> right? Yeah. When the wheels fr- sliding all the way up the lid. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And they drop the nose and just die. Yeah. So that's scrubbing. Yeah, dude. Can we think of anyone else who can scrub? Like actually scrub. On a mountain bike. Uh, um, Dakota? Hill, maybe? Oh, Dakota can throw down. Aaron yeah, yeah. can throw down a scrub. Yeah, he was one of the ones I said. Um, what's his name? Cade Edwards? Uh, yeah. yeah. Bro. <laughs> For sure. Tell Sorry, but maybe? that kid is dirty on yeah. a bike. Holy smokes. And what he's doing is he's literally sliding tires. 
He's not carving a lip, yeah. which is what I think most people think. Like if you're carving a lip, you're changing, you know, your trajectory. So instead of going straight, yeah, you're making down the jump, the jump longer yep. diagonal. Yeah, right. No, but I've so. seen Mikey look like he has a motor on his bike off a lip, like the front wheel's up before he's off, and the rear's just sliding in a straight line. Yeah, because he has no weight on the rear tire, and he's yeah. so laid over. It's yeah. like a super impressive, impossible thing to do that like seven people can do. Chaos Seagrave, see uh, Seagraves as well. Like mm. him and Cade together are. Like, I'll be honest, they were like the little punk kids in the in the pits and stuff where you're like, dude, these kids are freaking annoying. Mm. Doing jibs and bunny hops and spraying gravel up yeah. against your tent. And also you're like, oh my gosh, knock that crap off. And you see him on a bike and you're just like, you are so incredibly talented. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is insane. Yeah. Anytime. Like, thank I, you for the gravel. Uh-huh. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Please it's never like, change. Oh my gosh. You're <laughs> like, like, holy crap. I, that's the only thing I can say. I'm like, the amount of the things that those kids can do on those freaking bikes Mm -hmm. are insane. Like the jumps they can hit, the whips they can throw, the scrubs. You're like, and you're trying to race world cups. Like I love it, but Mm -hmm. you're so just ultimately talented on a bike. I think I heard you say Mitch Ropolato is like same type of rider. Like the talent just oozing out of his pores. Yeah. I consider him and Kay to be like two of the best bike riders in the world, just across all disciplines. Mitch can nose bonk anything anywhere at any point on a bicycle ride. I learned, (laughs) I I learned a hard lesson with Mitch, um, early on, on specialized with him and don't follow Mitch. Is that the lesson? (laughs) That's a general rule. Absolutely. Um, I couldn't follow him if I life depended on it, (laughs) but we were in Leo gang and there's like a little dirt pump track behind the hotel. And there's like this janky little roll in, just real short. It was like barely get a bike in that would fit in the first transition. And there's like three, like a six pack. So there's like three double rollers. And we're all just messing around on dirt jump bikes. Tra- Might have been on our trail bikes, like the warm up bikes or something like that. And I don't know what got into me, but I looked at Mitch and I said, I'll give you the money in my wallet. I think it's like 20 euro I had in my wallet. I was like, I'll give you this 20 euro. If you can no pedal, you get one little like cheater crank uh-huh. off the start. And then you have to jump all three, you have to double all three of these like rollers. And he was like, deal. And it's, he said deal so fast. I was like, oh crap. Like, cause even I was like, <laughs> right, I was, no, no crank. Like we were messing around and we we're trying stuff. And like, I was watching him do other things and I'm like, Ooh, I don't know if he could do this one. Like he's talented, but I was like, ah, I think I got him on this one. Like throwing these little challenges. And he, he's like, how many tries do I get? I was like, I'll give you three tries. Like I'm that confident that you can't do this. And he goes, absolutely. And like first one, he goes just totally jacked it up. Like, I don't even think he cleared the first one. Like barely didn't get his rear tire <laughs> over the, the landing. I was like, Ooh, yeah, got him. And then like, if you know miss he was just trying something and then that second try he almost got it like second try is like the last jump where he like pulled too hard and cased a little bit and he's like oh and i'm like doesn't count cased it like back tires right on top and he goes <laughs> got it <laughs> and dude and then third try just greased it and i was like oh my gosh just then he never spent that 20 euro. He had like a clear phone case on his phone and he stuck it in the back of it and he showed it to me every single chance that he got. He's just like, hey man, remember this? <laughs> I was like, never again will I bet. Him and Aaron never bet Aaron either on anything. Like you could be sitting there throwing rocks in this trash can behind us mm-hmm. and missing every single one for two hours. And if the second you put like five bucks, if you can make the next one, he will drain it like just <laughs> clutch. Like I have a video on my phone of him throwing a little tangerine or like a cutie orange through a tire swing at Fort William from like 40 yards away. <laughs> just cause money was on the way. Yeah. We we're throwing rocks oh, at him. We we're trying to like, there were all these, it's like an obstacle course there. If you know the pits in Fort William, there's like this little, like, um, you know, you're up on these ladders and you're tied in and all the stuff like that. So there's like these little 12, 14 inch tires. So real small. And we were just end of the day after practice, like waiting for the van to come pick us up, go back to the accommodations. And we're just throwing rocks in the gravel parking lot. And he just like comes out of the pit. He's like, what are you doing? Like eating his cuties. Stuff like that. I'm like, I'm just trying to throw it. So he starts throwing rocks at it and stuff like that. Came close a couple of times. I was like, hey, five bucks. If you can throw that orange through that. And he goes, yeah. All right. And just like grin and just winds up 
and drains it. Like <laughs> one try, first try. Just <laughs> dink. And I'm like, you frick. Like I probably own like $200 worth of bets that I've <laughs> lost in like situations just trying to get that stuff back. Double or nothing's done. Like he just sinks everything. <laughs> Would you say Aaron's a little competitive? 100%. 100%. <laughs> quietly competitive. But like he's that dude. He said it to me a few times, but dude, he will, he's a diesel. Like he will take you to the depths of a pool and just drown you. <laughs> like, <laughs> like figuratively, not physically. Like he won't oh, actually okay. like kill you at the bottom of the pool, but like, that's his, men- like, like that's his awesome, mentality yeah. and like challenges. Like if you, if somebody wanted to just like challenge him to a gym workout or something like that, he'd just be like, okay, let's go. And he will just grind and grind <laughs> and grind and never stop like a Buffalo dude. And just like, he will take you into the hurt locker mm-hmm. and then just sit down and like meditate in the hurt locker while you're just panicking and dying and hoping it all ends. And he'll just like smile. At that's you like his like, happy place. That's his happy place. Yeah, I'm so like, sick. But uh, if you think about it, like one of his first trainers was John Tomac mm-hmm. and like old Johnny T dude, he is like that. Like, mm-hmm. like he just lives to put you in a hurt locker and look at Eli. Like, he trains the same way. Like they're just gnarly dudes. Johnny T raced a full World Cup downhill season with drop bars because he was just getting ready for the road tour season. Right. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> what a nut. Aaron has some Lots really amazing. Aaron has some really fun stories about that guy and like training with him. I, f- I forget all the details that they were they were going for a mountain bike ride near Elsinore. Yeah. And it was like it was gonna be a big ride, but it was also like a little bit of a shuttle thing. Like it's gonna be like a one way thing. So they had like a a car parked at the bottom of skid marks or something like that, somewhere down on that mm-hmm. zone of grand Avenue. And then the, where they took off from was like up at the towers or well, something like that. And, and did the classic, like forgot the keys in the other car to the car at the bottom. And they had just ridden like every truck trail ridge line down and up. And like Aaron showed up and it was like his first mountain bike ride with John Tomac. And he's like, in, he had no chamois, like board shorts and like pedals. And like might even been a borrowed bike. I don't know if you ever get the chance to ask him this story. He tells it so good. And whoever forgot the keys and it wasn't like, Oh crap, let's make a phone call or you forgot the keys. You got to get the one. Like Tomac was like, all right, let's go. And like everybody had to freaking go back <laughs> up to the top. And and Aaron was just like done. And he was like, go. Okay. Like, this is just what I do now. <laughs> like, and Johnny T is like 45 at this point, right? Probably like, 50s, probably yeah. even. Like, and he's still to this day. What does Rich call him? Have you heard him? Mm-mm. Oh, what's he call him? Did he call something today? I don't think so. Deagle? Steagle or something like that? I forget. He told me. I might be thinking of somebody else. The tracks that he put yeah, it'll be in Rich's podcast. But he just told a story about, like, Johnny T at a World Cup, like. It wasn't sp- a World Cup. It was just like a Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. But he was on rollers at the top, basically. Yeah. And kind of like the only one, which is already like intimidation factor is pretty high. Only one on rollers, which are loud. But he got <laughs> off, like hopped off, and then kind of like got over in line for like staging for like the race. Yeah. And just did a track stand for like twenty minutes <laughs> <laughs> until it was his time to get in the gate and then just got in the gate, continued track standing, and then dropped in for his run. Oh my god. I was like, that's amazing. That's the most incredible I've ever heard. My legs would be smoked. <laughs> totally, right? <laughs> my back. That guy got to sit down. Man. Just a wildly <laughs> unnecessary way to tire yourself before your race run. Yeah. And he won, I'm sure. Oh, right? probably. probably. Yeah. yeah. He's like, I gotta make this local race harder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love stories like that, those dudes. Yeah. Um yeah, we f- we realize uh, when you're out for a second that anybody who sees this podcast will just assume all we're going to do is talk about the bike. So oh, maybe yeah. we should mention it. <laughs> hey, on that stuff, like I'm not to divert again, bring me back. But mm-hmm. I was having this thought the other day. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Like it's an hour drive in and out of the shop. So it's like I have a solid two, two and a half hours a day in the truck of like just podcasts like all mm-hmm. the time audiobooks like everything it's take in everything i can and i realize like a lot of the and i'm sorry guys mountain bike podcasts is are like very inter- interview like 
I don't want to say not good because they're like, I do enjoy quite a few of them actually, but the style and it could just be me personally, but the styles that I'm noticing are very like cut and dry interview. It's like mm-hmm. a question, the answer comes and then it's like, sweet. Uh, I was just, what about this? this? And it's like, yeah, as a listener, I'm going, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. Hold, can you elaborate on that? Like, Ask him a question about totally. like he just laid out some cool stuff and you just went sweet. Mm-hmm. And what Loaded. about your training? Mm-hmm. And you're like, what? What about your training? <laughs> that dude just had like five nuggets in that little conversation mm-hmm. or like answer, and you didn't touch on any of. Them. Like I love these free form like podcasts hmm. and more of like conversational tones where there's really no directions. Like sure, you get some questions on parts so of it's whatever diversion you can bring it back in a little bit and have something to talk about but yeah dude just just rapping and going and like oh and that made me think of this mm-hmm. and then that kind of stuff is like i don't know what you call it free form free flow whatever but it's i enjoy it we yeah. call it the inside line the inside, <laughs> inside line, line right along <laughs> yeah so mike what do you want to know um yeah it's not that's not for me to lead <clears throat> i'll let you guys. know what i can say <laughs> yeah it's actually i mean I don't know. Do we just start at the beginning of it for people that maybe are like outside looking in, saw what the team was racing on last year and is like, wait, a new bike. Why? Like, yeah. I know, I know intense obviously put something out and sure. a lot of people are kind of up to speed on that, but mm-hmm. first bike plan was always, it was a building to this bike. And for the record, we looked in the house for a gravy boat to set on the table, but we didn't have one. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Dude, somebody uh, sent me a DM of, uh, you know, Bert and Ernie. I think it was Bert, like, in his bathtub with bubbles and, like, a scrubber, and they, like, photoshopped him in it. I was like, I'm going to be honest, guys. Like, I love that. It was, it was hilarious. Like, we were hoping you would have one, like, separate from the bike we could use as an actual gravy boat. No. Just, like, for, like, a I think we, cereal. I think we used all of them. Dang. <laughs> yeah, Chris King has like the salt and pepper shaker. Yeah, yeah. like you guys could totally. We could totally make some gravy boats <laughs> gravy out of like boats. the old ones or something. Yeah, it'd be yeah. Amazing. And yeah. was the gravy boat more about getting the weight lower in the bike, or was it more about no. getting the kinematic you wanted? Kinematic we wanted. Okay. So that was just a byproduct. So it was like, okay, here's the kinematic we wanted, and then if you know about kinematics, it's it's these points that live in space, and then you're just connecting the dots. Right. It's mm-hmm. a very shortened version, layman version of it. Um, and to do all that, then that made the link as long as it had to be and had to swing the way it swung. If there wasn't that boat there, then it's running into the down tube. If you do a traditional down tube, we would have to do a custom down tube, which we didn't have time for, Mm -hmm. or it would have to have like this big swing belly under there or Cannondale pull shock. Oh, I can't tell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we weren't yeah. going to go down that route again. <laughs> Lessons learned. Um, and so. Or a rock shark's pole shark. <laughs> one of the two. Yeah. Um, and so it was just kind of born out of necessity for that one. Um, to your point, everybody asked like, hey, you're kind of gaining some speed on that towards the end and getting the momentum going and mm-hmm. results were coming back around. Absolutely. Um, that, that was yes to the bike. That was, there's, like anything else, there's a lot of factors that go into those results and, and that ball was rolling. Um, confidence was building. I always say confidence builds speed, speed wins races. Um, there's the age old question of, do you tweak on something until you think you're the fastest or do you just run your setup, get the most comfortable on that setup and Mm -hmm. then start building confidence in that. And then that's where your speed starts coming from. I think Mm -hmm. it's a combination of both, but, um, so yeah, that bike was always a means to it. There was never a plan to go to production with that. When we when we started the project, it was um, we were originally going to do like a four bar and a six bar bike together in the off season, and ideally ride and test them, and then race which one we thought was better. Quickly learned having no, not done like a uh, horse link bike in a long time or in recent times, like there's a lot more we needed to learn. And so, and it, we weren't going to have the time to do both, um, especially with a six bar bike or what we're calling this one six link, um, that there's a bit more that we're going to need to do and know and explore that we don't have time for. So the simpler of the two is the four bar bike forward on that. And then we will learn everything we can about that bike. And then we will build a six bar bike at the end of the season. And then, 
ride the two and decide. We learned pretty quickly that what we wanted out of a bike was going to have to come from what you see behind me. Um, and out of a six link bike and just having the design, not, I don't want to say design parameters. What I want to say, like the flexibility to isolate the characteristics that we're after a for like a really good balanced bike. That's going to be great for customers, but to also give the athletes everything they want out of a bike that they know they can win on. Now, a lot of those factors were that they liked about the last bike we were on, which we called the HP four made it into this bike. And a lot of the ones that we didn't like about it, we got to delete. Mm-hmm. And so it was like kind of a no brainer step for us. Mm-hmm. But this bike was being worked on while we were racing all of last year. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we basically said, all right, four bars is going to be the quickest, easiest out of the two. Let's get that done and learn everything we can learn from that. I mean, that was a tight time frame. Like we're, we got that bike like weeks before the first round. Um, and learned a lot in those couple of weeks very quickly. <laughs> um, and so, um, and it was just a constant, very high speed, stressful process for me, but man, the riders stuck it out and continue to feed, give feedback and continue to develop it all the while taking notes. And while this was being built and like learning from the mistakes of the last one and making sure we didn't make them on this one. So it was really fun really like um i tend to get really in the weeds like we were talking earlier before we started like forget kind of what we're working on Mm -hmm. and how cool a lot of this is because you just see it every day constantly in and out and maybe sometimes when somebody sees it for the first time they're like holy crap Mm -hmm. and you're like what holy crap what (laughs) (laughs) wait real real quick on that Can we touch on just why anybody who's watching this can't see it? Sure. <laughs> um, I mean, it's yeah. probably valuable. <laughs> no, it's it's nothing crazy. Mm-hmm. I think um, it's good. It's good reason. Yeah, it's it good there. reason. Um, so I think there's there are companies who are very cloak and dagger about development, which is fine. That's what their prerogative. Um, I like a little bit of the cloak and dagger style, and Intense is very open in development, which is a shock to me uh, as the first company I went to they're like yeah you don't have to cover anything go for it run it I'm like wait what like what do I say when media asks about it like tell them tell them <laughs> well, I'm like are you sure <laughs> <laughs> now or should I wait like and they're like nah like and so and now we've, I think we've kind of landed a little bit in the middle um, we we don't revert all of our cards obviously um, but we do like to keep the interest and keep people informed and like be open and transparent in the development process about things we learn and stuff. And you don't always hear it, but it's like, Jeff's not afraid to show anything. He'll show you well with the new bike. He'll show the new 3d model of it and stuff mm-hmm. like that, uh, which I'm sure everybody's seen. And, and it's not what everybody thinks. It's not to like gain traction or spur rumors or anything like that. Like Jeff's just gen, he's an just artist stoked. dude and a craftsman. <laughs> and he's like, heck yeah, look at this thing. It's sick picture. Post it. <laughs> Like, heck yeah, dude. Like, that's sick excitement. Like, yeah. we should. But getting your point. So um, to that point, we are, yes, we're open in the development. Everybody's pretty much seen this bike. We're not covering anything up. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not, there's probably a few side profile shots. Like, we're not too worried about any of that stuff. But um, this particular bike, we did a fun experiment on. It was like a, a extra backbone and what we're calling the backbone section anyways. Uh, and so we had an extra one of those and we said, let's, um, it's kind of twofold. We want to see what the machine capabilities were a little bit. And then we were just like, let's see how much we can drill out of this thing and (laughs) mill out of it and then break it. Like, let's just for any other reason, just, uh, let's, I don't know. We're like a bunch of little kids talking trucks, man. Like, <laughs> why not? Like, let's do it. Just, there Champions really shit. isn't like a, a why or like a, as scientific why as you think, but it was like, okay, like let's, there is like, it's the wall. It, it was very, there's the okay. wall right there. dude. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so, yeah, oddly enough on, on the one that hasn't been milled out. Yeah. Was the ones I had like yeah. super close races. Clint went back. And then this one was the one I got fourth on. Two flex, oh. less arrow. Oh man, yeah. it's way less something. <laughs> I don't know. So, anyways, it was just a. It, it's an experiment. Um, it's milled out in a bunch of places. I'm not covering it up 
or anything like that on bigger public forms like this. Like we're not obviously trying to be that transparent about it, but I'm out riding in public and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, and so it was meant to go to machine lab testing and we decided to scrap that project and we were just going to break it on a machine basically, or get it broken and see where it breaks after we remove all of this support that we've built into it. Uh, so it's a little bit of a weight loss experiment, see how much we could potentially lose on the next generation of it, where we could lose it. And what does that do to certain areas of strength? Mm -hmm. Um, where does it take away the strength? Because you're not really obviously adding strength anymore. Um, and then we decided just to scrap that because we kind of, um, we did a different route. There's some timing things as well and costs. And it was like, ah, was like we're already done with the next generation and we've learned everything we can learn. And we weren't going to really learn much from it anyways. And so I just raised my hand and said, can I ride it then? Like, <laughs> the machine you're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the engineer was like, um, sure. Just be really careful. And like, cause it was meant to break. He's like, I, I machined all that stuff out in a way to see where it was going to break. And he's like, so it will break. <laughs> so he's like, I just need you to be very aware of that and, uh, watch, watch out, like have fun. I was like, off to cool. JP to ride. Yeah. And then, and then <laughs> I just gave it to my boy. Like, hey, man, just bang out laps, please. Take it home. <laughs> no. <laughs> Should be fine. Nothing. Uh, sign this waiver first. Yeah, Nothing sign this waiver first. We legit do have waivers for yeah. that reason. Like, Smart. Yeah. Even like employees of it, it's like, all right, mm-hmm. we're putting on a prototype bike. Like, let's just make sure everything's fine. <laughs> it's, it's a prototype. Like, um, and we've learned a ton, like from this bike, um, from the bikes that the guys are on, which we're calling the Gen 1. This is also Gen 1, just machined out. Um, and, and what's happening, manufacturing, prototyping, like so much and done such a good job. Like I have to tell those dudes, like they've done like the engineers and stuff, like you guys have to get them on. We were trying, but it just didn't work out timing wise, Mm -hmm. but it's so to my point earlier, it's like, I try to be the dumbest person in the room. I don't uh, often understand why. I get to come on and talk about this bike right now <laughs> or about some of the stuff. Cause I will trip and stumble over some of the stuff, forget everything that we've actually gone through. But it's like, um, Devin Sullivan, the guy who's we hired on and is our ride dynamics engineer. Um, it's his official title, but he's basically coming in and revamping our entire line, um, going through bike by bike. And this was his first project. So like when he came on board, it's like, okay, Hey, here's, he wasn't there for the last, the HP four, but he mm-hmm. came on this one and he goes, okay, cool. Where are you at on that one? Sweet. What do you want out of this one? Sweet. A few meetings, flew to some races, worked on setup. Um, he's worked at SRAM, Fox, Cane Creek, um, all kinds of stuff. So, um, and his knowledge and experience has been incredible. Like it's been awesome. The guys have learned so much from him, even in just bike setup mm-hmm. and learning that um, you can't even generalize bike setup. Mm-hmm. As much as we were trying earlier mm-hmm. to generalize for the public, mm-hmm. These guys, you can't like, not for the individual, but more for the bike. You know what I mean? Like this bike doesn't ride like a demo eight and our setup on this bike wouldn't be the same as a demo eight. Like that sounds obvious. There's a lot of people that would set them up very similarly or something like that or a track. Cause they have a similar looking suspension design, the six link. Uh, I guess that that wasn't the point Uh, of that. Uh, Arbitrarily pick specialized, but sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, but any other bike, um, whatever track comes all single pivot, whatever. They might try to just transfer settings over and start there. Mm-hmm. And so it's, um, yeah, that's what we're trying to do on this one. So it's not that we're hiding anything special, but anybody who saw this would clearly be like, what are they doing? That seems dumb. John? <laughs> and it probably, I don't know, maybe it is, maybe it's not. We're mm-hmm. just, it's just an experiment really. And so it's like, it's not going to see the light of day. It's nothing we're moving forward with. Um, and a waiver was signed. And a waiver was Dude, probably was signed. Even... John, you said you're not hiding anything special, but I think we all agree your bike project is special. It's pretty special. Yeah, it's yeah. super cool. And it, yeah, it's fun to be a part of. I am uh, oftentimes don't understand why I'm getting to ride this sick of a bike. <laughs> There's been kids out of Fontana that are like, one guy was like, I was with uh, a member of our CEO team, John Eric Burleson. Mm-hmm. And, uh, him and I were out there doing laps. He's stoked on racing, like loves it. Comes from a racing family, big pedigree. And this kid was like, I got to ask, man, 
how'd you get that bike? <laughs> <laughs> and, and John Eric was John Eric was standing there and he like heard the whole thing. And I just looked at him. And I was like, how do I answer this one? <laughs> and he goes, about to use the face card. Yeah. He's like, he's like, um, I don't know. Um, he's like, he works for intense and he, the, uh, what'd he say? Uh, IFR intense factory racing technical director. <laughs> He's like, so he got one. I was like, yeah, that's why I got one. <laughs> You're like, I have a job title. I was like, I have that's no, amazing. I like I have no buddy. I, mean, I asked myself know what my that job question. Title is? Yeah. I think there's a reason. <laughs> no, seriously. Do you know what my job title is? You know, you've heard of me. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was a funny thing. I was like, buddy, I ask myself the same question often. <laughs> <laughs> Not you want to try it? Just suck <laughs> yeah. this way through. Like, you're the only one that would ride the one that has all the windows cut in it. They're like, well, we really shouldn't. Yeah. But if you're going to, we're going to put careful. John on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ain't never been scared. You asked. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, I mean, I don't ride a bike as hard as these guys do. I don't put them through the paces like they do. I don't think either. So. Um, it'll be fine. Yeah, it'll be fine. I'll ride it for a short time, and then I'll wait for the next version to come out, and it'll probably be the ones that those guys, the athletes, get to ride. And then when they get the next version, I'll take their old one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I get the hand me downs. I'm okay with it though, because dude, downhill bikes are so sick. They're so <laughs> sick. Like ah, I heard something the other day. I was like, I don't know why. I think it's one of your guys' podcasts. And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> it's crazy that people still make downhill bikes. But I'm like, us. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, <laughs> that was last week. True, <laughs> from but a business standpoint. But they're so sick. They're so sick. I mean, of like, course. JP was like, he got on the bike today and was like, he hasn't been on a downhill bike in like a year, two years, something mm-hmm. like that. And it was just like, he's like, this is so fun. Mm-hmm. Like you're riding with the boys, everybody's laughing, like you're hooning, <laughs> just smashing. He's like, I, f- I have to like learn that I can trust this thing. Totally. To just. Yeah annihilate and go mock chicken into this rock garden and everything's gonna be okay it's like slow motion yeah like they're so good now there's mm-hmm. so many people who haven't ridden one mm-hmm. and they're just like oh so pin and it's like yeah but on a downhill bike you'd be like oh i'm just cruising mm-hmm. yeah like that was scary for what You're like i can hit this mm-hmm. faster yeah probably <laughs> i have an identity crisis if i didn't get to ride one at least once a year <laughs> well and that's the thing too is like i i'm very much i don't know self-proclaimed probably workaholic i like i will almost always choose at least for the last few years, like I've just chosen work over riding, mm-hmm. which is not good. But it's like recently I've like reinvigorated my love of riding again. And then getting on the downhill bike was definitely part of that. And I'm like, mm-hmm. this is so sick. Yeah. And it's like, I will joke and make fun of myself all day long about going out to Fontana and racing the 30, 39 expert <laughs> class. I don't give a crap. That's dude. what doing it does. You're like, dude, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good on this. It's thing. so like, damn fun. I gotta see how I'm it's doing. It's so <laughs> fun. And yeah. it's like, I will never crap on anybody. The dude who's like, cause it's very easy to be like, this guy's 55 years old. You see some random dude. And he's like, why is this guy out here racing downhill bikes? I'm like, cause, cause he, he is having a blast. Yeah. And that's who you want to be when you grow up. Yeah. Like, don't forget that. 100%. <laughs> I'm like, that dude's awesome. And like, I hope I'm 55 years old and stoked to be racing my downhill bike. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Heck yeah. Absolutely. I don't, 55 and plus, and there's one person in my class and I won. <laughs> Hell yeah, I won. <laughs> By 11 seconds. I hope I smoke this dude. Put it on Roots and Rain. Yeah. Put it up there. Put the results up there, dude. Log Five them. Five time. Log Jeez. them. Five time Fontana champion. champion by the time I had to move dude. up to the next stage. Group. Absolutely. I, will, <laughs> I don't need those times. World Cup stats. <laughs> Uh, uh, look at my regional yeah stats. dude it's um yeah downhill bikes are so badass and that's why we do it like it's so fun and you learn so much from it like as a brand and from development stuff like mm-hmm. i mean it's pretty obvious and stuff trickles down and what you learn on this your dues don't um you'll learn that certain suspension platforms prefer perform better in the longer travel ranges Mm -hmm. and so um that's one thing we're looking a lot at and you'll start to notice um maybe some suspension platform changes coming in the future from us we have a lot of stuff coming down the pipeline and it's a lot of it's from what we've learned from what we've been doing over the last few years so tech mm -hmm. rumor alert tech rumor alert yeah keep an eye out there's always something we're working on (laughs) stuff being written all over the country um and yeah, getting out oh, really? riding different areas and different bikes and different platforms and stuff like that. And I'm learning more and more 
just I'll beat a dead horse, but I'm just trying not to be the smartest person in the room. And like, I'm looking at what other brands are doing a lot more and how they approach things. And it's not to see or be as successful or avoid mistakes that they've made. Sure. There's that element, but I also look at some brands where it's like they blanket their entire line with one suspension platform. And I'm like, there was a need for that for sure. For a long time, like you kind of just got into one and then, mm that's what you were with for either patent reasons or whatever. And you couldn't stick away from it. And now we're starting to see brands branch out. Like we're not the only ones. There's other brands that are going, Oh, we can play with this design and this travel range. Mm -hmm. And maybe this cross country bike doesn't work with that suspension design, but works really well with this one Mm -hmm. and kind of like moving stuff around a little bit and a little more of like a integrated different style. I think we're going to see a lot of stuff changing in the future mm. as far as that's concerned. Two questions. Mm. One, maybe we're a bit more obvious, but the plans to go to production with the downhill bike at Ooh, some point. 100%. Yes. Okay. This bike will be the next production downhill bike. I can, I know I can say that. Sweet. And then two, what, how did you guys land on the six link design? Was that always the plan? Even, I mean, I guess you did mention that like you originally guys had two concept and ideas and two four ideas. bar was the easiest to, uh, execute first, but mm-hmm. what draws the team and everybody to developing a six link to get everything we want out of the bike. And what, what would you say? Like the main things are, it's, I mean, I know it's huge, it's but like, all the normal stuff. Um, you want the bike to be efficient. You want mm-hmm. it to not suck your energy efficient away for pedaling or efficient for pumping both. Okay. You know, because there are still sprints and pedals, on downhill tracks they're not they're few and far between but but pedaling wasn't like a a bullet point that we needed to like check off Mm -hmm. but efficiency in general like Mm -hmm. generating speed generating speed you want to you want to apply energy and get a return on that Mm -hmm. um that was a big thing for us um we learned it's it's very easy to make a bike go fast in a straight line it, that's not hard to do, uh, especially when you start playing with high pivots and idlers and all that kind of stuff. But to make it do that and turn well and be efficient and be light, like it's, there's always sacrifice. So mm-hmm. between like the four bar and a six link design, stuff like that with a six link, you're able to isolate more characteristics. Mm-hmm. And that just allows us to give the athletes more of what they wanted. So you can, you can give somebody a pretty good bike with a four bar. It's a great design, mm-hmm. like very simple. It's robust. Um, it's not, there's nothing wrong with it. Mm-hmm. It's not like we looked at it and went, that's a piece of crap. <laughs> we definitely got to go with this direction. <laughs> we need more links. Exactly. It was not that. <laughs> it was just more of like, okay, um, you know, we can go down this simple route, but we would be doing that knowing we're leaving something on the table. Mm-hmm. And we are just like, we're we're in this this we didn't come this far to leave anything else on the table like Mm -hmm. we are deep into this and we're committed to making the best bike we possibly can and like without saying anything like and i mean call it bias or marketing pump or whatever is like a freaking thing we nailed it like Mm -hmm. it's such a good bike in so many ways and it's like i was having a conversation literally as i pulled up to do the podcast just finishing a phone call with our engineer about some stuff and I'm like, we're in the weeds on like dumb stuff now. Yeah. Now we're like, we're not worried about the axle path. We're not worried about leverage ratio. Mm-hmm. Like we've nailed everything we wanted to nail and the guys are stoked with it. And yeah. now we're like, all right, how do we make it a little more compliant here? A little less compliant there. How do we shave a few grams here? Where can, what can we do with this? And then it's like, just fine tuning and then you know, hopefully into production soon. So, um, sweet. but yeah, I can say that the bike will be, will be the production bike. Mm-hmm. Um, it will not look like the bikes everybody sees right now or has seen. It will be slightly different design ID. Um, and just to give it a little more of the intense flair, mm-hmm. more refined. Yeah. A little yeah. more refined and stuff like that. Um, and then, there's one thing I'm going to leave out um, between, yeah, the, the guys will be on some cool things for this race season. Mm-hmm. And um, 
So keep and it will be aluminum. Peeled. Yeah, okay. keep your eyes peeled. And the production bike will be aluminum as well. Um, right now, there's no plan to go to carbon. Um, mm-hmm. It's never off the table or anything like that. You but... hear that tech form? <laughs> Who's so sure that it's going to be carbon? Yeah. <laughs> Is there yeah. a reason for that? Um, I mean, yes and no. Mm-hmm. You know, there's... There's reasons for everything. Um, I could probably, I could say if it was carbon or going to be carbon, it'd be way easier to make. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you that. Like aluminum is hard um, to get right, especially from a, like a, the characteristics of the material and what you want to bike. And especially if you're trying to go super light mm-hmm. um, and stuff like that. But depending on the design, how many of us have seen a carbon frame way more than the aluminum version mm-hmm. because they had weak areas and they had to put so much carbon in oh, a zone. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know what I mean? So carbon doesn't always translate to lighter. It's mm-hmm. more of like a ride characteristic that you're out of it. And so, yeah, we just, um, yeah, we're going with aluminum. Yeah. We really like it. And yeah. I mean, it's an extremely complex space to mm-hmm. engineer, right? So Hard. I imagine being able to just lay down plastic in the be configuration. Easier. You want. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For what we're doing, it'd be way easier in carbon, but, um, yeah, we're sticking with aluminum for now. I'm not saying there won't be a carbon one. That's not a hint that it's coming later. I I personally and honestly have no clue if we'll mm-hmm. ever do carbon on it or not. But maybe one day. So I got to ask for the nerds. Mm-hmm. And you can say yes, no, or no comment. Wink, nudge. <laughs> uh, four bar means you have a built-in, uh, what's it called? Floating brake arm, right? Like the rear brake is isolated from... The lower swing arm. Yeah. So you, you can your, tune your brake. Your, your rear end is decoupled. So you can tune anti-rise. Pivot. Okay. You've got six link, which means you can independently tune the shock rate separate from the wheel path. Yes. Wheel wheel path, shock rate, um, anti-rise, anti-squat. Yeah. And then you can do whatever you want with the axle path because you can just move that lower pivot up and down. So right. you're able to sort of independently tune... Axle path, mm-hmm. anti-rise on the brake. With axle path, you're also messing around with like anti-squat and pedal kickback. Right. And then shock rate. Mm-hmm. So you can independently tune all that stuff. Essentially, yes. And we did <laughs> a really good job of it. Char- Charlie's over here. Like, I'm not going to give you any numbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but there's some important numbers that were important to us. And it was like we were like... I just high five the engineer. I was like, I don't know how you did that. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard for me to understand a lot of it too. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're not constantly like looking and studying all those characteristics out of a bike and what they do and mm-hmm. how they do it. Well, and they interact too. Yeah. Right? Well, it's not like there's a perfect one of those. Exactly. Because if you change one, it changes. You're always that. sacrificing somewhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's just between like a, again, just going back like between a, four bar or six bar six link whatever you want to call it. it's not a true six bar we know <laughs> we know um and so you are you're just sacrificing less mm-hmm. or not compromising as much as you would be with like a four bar or a single pivot you mm-hmm. know what i mean like you run a single pivot yeah dude there's some single pivots out there that that rule where do they rule you know what i mean mm-hmm. like what characteristic did they decide to put all their chips on. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of like, sometimes if you think about it that way, like a single pivot, like you're putting your stack of chips in this characteristic. Mm-hmm. And you go to four bar, you can take your chips and you can put a little bit here, a little bit here. You can spread them out evenly. Mm-hmm. You can stack this characteristic and this one, and then you go six, and then you can do a little bit more. And you know what I mean? You can just spread the love mm-hmm. a little bit more. That's like, it's a pretty non-technical way of explaining that kind of stuff. No, that's good. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I hope it makes sense. I hope I didn't mess that up. Again. Did you have... Probably you, the dumbest person in the room again. Did you have the post chip analogy ready to go? No, that just that just came to That me was pretty solid. Right well, we were looking yeah. at the bike visually. We're like, oh, like what? It, wonder why this link is like this. And then we're kind of like, well, I don't think we have the, the degree to understand why it's like me neither. this. It's just the way it is. Yeah. yeah me neither. Mm-hmm. Uh, the that, engineers, that's what we hire those thing. guys for. Like you said, hire the people smarter than you. Yeah. That's sort of like 
Tony Hawk Pro Skater, when you are like, I really want the best like manual, I'm going to go with Rodney Mullen because he's got all right. the stats there. there you go. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm a big analogy guy. And so yeah. they just come to me like <laughs> quite. And it's if you just ask me to make an analogy, me, I'll freeze on the spot. <laughs> that was just, a really good they're one. They're 100% organic. Assuming it's correct. That was really good. Yeah. Assuming it's correct. Uh, yeah. Disclaimer. To the eight bar. <laughs> Can we put an asterisk mm-hmm. next yeah. to that one? And <laughs> if it's not correct, please take it out. Make me look smart. <laughs> 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 the new intense marketing videos are just going to be just gonna you playing poker. <laughs> me throwing poker chips at a mic. <laughs> <laughs> just adding bars. We need more of throw. this. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Rebounds a little like a swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> the higher the jump, the harder you hit. <laughs> You're not wrong. Uh, back in yeah. the 80s. Mm-hmm. Should we wrap it up? So what We're done. I was going to say, what else you guys got? Man. I don't know. I mean, that was super fun, though. Yeah, I feel like we talked like, about so much rad stuff. I know. I like chopping. I like, like I said, dude. I like these podcasts where you can just chop it up and like mm-hmm. legit talk about. I hope. I mean, I hope I didn't step on any toes. Um, I always put that disclaimer out there. <laughs> no. Piss anybody off at work. Say anything I was supposed to say. <laughs> John, we didn't <laughs> even ask you about broken chains or cranks. I mean, we did. Oh, please so do. Good. Please do. <laughs> no, 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 we're good. <laughs> please. <laughs> Please is do. This, have you had an interview where you didn't get asked about those? I mean, uh, or is it I like one know. of those like un like untouched subjects that like people just don't go there? No, I've read you I, answer that question like yeah, yeah, twenty I mean, times. I've, yeah. No, I've answered the question of the broken chain stuff and told that story <laughs> mm. probably a hundred times. That do you double check, there. triple check chains now? No, I just mm. put a new chain on every uh, race. Well, that actually ties into an Instagram mm. question we got. Can we comment on Team Robot torching John for the picture of him chilling in the pits with a beer the day before Gwyn's 2015 <laughs> change That was run. sick. <laughs> Honestly, that was one of those things where I read that and I was like, I was like, that's incredible. <laughs> that I like so this sick. guy. Yeah, I was like, I don't, I, I don't even know if I, if I was your was it? He, did it even say Team Robot on there or anything like that? I don't know. No, I don't know if I right. saw it. I just, I, remember I just saw the comment and I was like, Matt, I didn't know. Honestly, I didn't know that was you, dude. I was like, Matt, props to that, dude. Like, that's a pretty. I think it was one of those ones where I read it and I was like, ah, dude. I like showed the other mechanics. Like, look at this, dude. <laughs> and it was the funny thing is, like, that was a fully staged photo. So that was what, 2014, 15? That's no, funny. I, I don't want to oh. say I don't want to say fully staged. It was the mm-hmm. day before it was. It's just, it was like day after qualifying. But they were shooting lifestyle. No, it was. I think it was Nathan Hughes. Um, sorry, yeah. Nathan. Love. He's our photographer now. Like known him forever. Great dude. And um, I was done with work for the day. Like early. Like finished qualifying. Wash the bike. New tires on for race day. Bikes been checked, prepped, all the stuff. Like I'm not putting a new chain on every day. Like put the chain on the beginning of the weekend like it was new chain every race like i had that rule then but i had it now like and um yeah i was done and i think so that was in leo gang obviously and they do like air shows there there's always like the red because the red mm-hmm. bull hangar mm-hmm. 49 or hangar 52 whatever is nearby because so red bull is austria right yeah. and so <laughs> on like i forget what day there's always like these badass old planes flying over and stuff like that so there's always pictures of dudes just staring at the sky and all that kind of stuff and i forget where everybody was i think the athletes had already gone back to the hotel and i was like just waiting for maybe the team manager to come back and lock the van up i didn't have i don't remember what the what it was i was the only one in the pits though and from what i remember if somebody else was there i'm sorry um and i was like oh just end of the day and there was always like have a beer at the end of the day and i was just chilling in the pits and nathan came by and was like everybody's kind of gone and he goes oh man you're the only one like here he's like can i get some photos i was like yeah sure takes photos of the bikes does the thing he's like hey dude he's like you should sit in a lawn chair out here and just watch the air show and can i get a picture of that i was like while you finish your beer i was like absolutely pull a lawn chair out sit down legit just watching the air show <laughs> drinking the beer like it's a great day great end to my day i'm done early. or so you thought charlie's just in his ear if you get the photo dude, i'm gonna i'm gonna go ho- i'm gonna go back to the hotel which is walking distance i'm gonna take a shower there's a spa there go there's like hot cold saunas like all kinds of yeah, stuff you, you deserve it you've had a tough ah, day go wrong. i was yeah. like what a great day look at this view like i'm soaking it all in and then that photo comes out <laughs> after 
or no, <laughs> it went out like that night or uh-huh. something like that. Yeah, yeah. And then the next day the friggin' chain breaks. And then it was just like, yeah, what was the comment? What were dude? you doing? <laughs> yeah. uh, John Hall definitely not checking that definitely chain. Definitely not checking that chain. <laughs> you should have been doing some more work so it's sitting on your ass drinking beer. <laughs> I mean, I don't remember what was written, but it basically it's writes itself, it. right? The joke <laughs> is the photo. Dude, I read it and I was like, yeah, honestly, that's pretty funny. I can laugh at that. Oh, I've never been. I dude, I've had people like that know me now. They know what I do. Like they know I'm like some mechanic, like bike mechanic for a big race team or something like that. But maybe they're not. They're not like all bike people. And like they'll send videos to Instagram. How you do? You like send memes and videos and stuff to your buddies on Instagram. And I'm like, I'll get like a. I got a video of that race from my neighbor one time. <laughs> And he's he like, knows. Can you imagine? And he's like, <laughs> he's like, dude, look at this dude. Is broke this his, your worst nightmare? It was like, it was like, dude, this dude broke his chain and still won the race. But he didn't know. Did not know. Amazing. And then I just said, <laughs> I was like, I was like, look at the thumbnail. Do you recognize the guy standing behind him? And he's like, no. I'm like, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I was there. <laughs> like, not only was I there, that's my guy. It's just like that's yeah. that's, that's my chain. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I cut that chain. That's happened like five or six times where I've been yeah. sent that video, be like, dude, have you seen this? Like, uh-huh. A time or two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have. I've lived it. That's yeah. It's a memory. I was there. See, you Come. have such like almost a scarier job or a emotionally tougher job than the actual racer. Cause if they crash, they're like, oh man, I crashed. Right. Yeah. But you this don't guy know. has done every, and you're like, okay, I'm gonna, I am trying to do everything I possibly can. <laughs> Best bike in the world. Because it's like, ruin your day. <laughs> like Bill Belichick, he said, "Is a great quote," and I know everyone hates Bill Belichick, but I love this quote. He said, "Coaches don't win games; players win games. Yeah. Coaches lose games." Yeah. Right. Hundred percent. And it's like, ooh, that's a pretty heavy responsibility. And right, I feel like that. Like, if there's ever if you can't see what's happened or you know, they're supposed to be coming through a split and they haven't, and you know that there's been an issue or you hear the crowd or like, I've not known the result and been either headed back to the chairlift or on the chairlift and passing people and they see you and they go like, sorry, man. <sighs> or they give you, just give you that look, even if they don't say That's anything and you're rough. like, what happened? Oh no. And they're like, sorry, man. Did, Obviously, it wasn't good. You don't watch the live feed? Or is it delayed? Um, nowadays, they... So, in the recent years, they've had the live feed at the top. Mm-hmm. But before that, it wasn't there. Not like on a phone or something, though? No, we didn't have plans that worked in Europe. Oh. We're talking... Plans like were tight. Technology is gone, especially phone technology, is like mm-hmm. through the roof lately. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I have a global plan now that affects nothing i can text call instagram social media facetime wherever in the world Mm -hmm. and my plan doesn't change like it's Mm -hmm. the same every month back then like i had to buy roaming or Mm -hmm. i could only function on wi-fi yeah you get half a gig a day which gets unless you did like the sim card thing which i'm not into and all that kind of stuff so anyways um so yeah sometimes you didn't know Mm -hmm. um that particular race jason marsh um Menards mechanic Marshy was at the top and he had he was living in France so he had like a European sim card and he was watching the race. Aaron was number one qualifier? Yes. Last guy down the track? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Number one. Mm-hmm. I just assume he was the number one sure qualifier. Warner yeah. Yelling like the entire yeah. in the whole. Huh? You can't, you can't hear Warner yelling just over the entire mountain. No. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately not. He does have a voice but no not from up yeah, there. Yeah. But man I I I had Aaron's like water bottle in my hand and when it snapped out of the gate, I probably dropped the biggest F bomb I ever have and like threw the bottle against Can the you hear start that? hut. No, uh, I was going to say you can't, you, you can't see me. It probably just looks like I, cause it just cuts to like, they just follow him. And so you mm-hmm. can't see me uh, at all anymore. And I threw the bottle and I was like, I was inappropriate. I need to <laughs> I can do that. So I pick it up and it's just like, you're an idiot. And like my first thought was like, you're fired. Like you're done that. Like, I don't know why my brain just goes there. Like worst case scenario. But I was like, you're done. That's mm-hmm. it. Dude, that's a career ender. Like your number one qualifier leading the points, whatever the case, like, and you just ruined it. Like for specialized, for Aaron, for everybody championship gone. Like, thanks for playing. But then he wins. Like what a roller coaster. Of well, emotions. just like, and all of that goes through your mind in like a second or less than, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. and like I make my way back and it was me Marshy and, and 
Doug Hatfield, Dougie Fresh from mm-hmm. Santa Cruz. If anybody knows Dougie Fresh, like, man, is an absolute legend. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, man. And Jason had it on his phone. He's like, oh, man, you want to come watch Aaron's race run? And it was delayed by like 30 seconds or something like that. Mm-hmm. And um, I was like, nope. He goes, what's wrong? Like, knew something was wrong. And I was like, broke his freaking chain. And he's like, ah, sorry, man. And I was like, sorry? Like, in my head, I'm like, what? sorry, man? I was like, I'm fired. I'm done. I just lost, like, my dream job. <laughs> Guaranteed. Like, this is where my mind goes. <laughs> and I'm just like, no. Gonna it's, tell I'm like, sorry. it's not okay. He's like, no, no, it's all good, dude. Like, it's fine. It happens. I'm like, no. No, it doesn't. This doesn't happen to me. This doesn't happen to the number one guy in the world. No. Mm-hmm. That's unacceptable. Like, mm. so, like, my standards are just so high. I'm like, I'm my own worst critic for the people who know, they know this. So I'm like mm. hardest on myself. But, um, yeah. And he goes, it's going to be fine. And he hands me his water bottle. He's like, just take a drink. You're going to be fine. I was like, I don't need a freaking drink. I have a <laughs> water bottle here. I'm just like zoning out. Like, my life's ruined. And he's like, take a drink. Everything's going to be fine. I was like, I don't need your water. I have a water bottle. I'm good. And he goes, take a drink now. I was like, oh, God. And like, I just squirt it, and it's wine. He has, Marshy has <laughs> wine in a water bottle. It's very on brand. And I just squirted this drink of wine in my mouth. I'm like, that is not what I was expecting, <laughs> nor what I wanted in this moment in my life. But it like snapped me out of it a little bit. And then he's like, just watch. He's like, he's like, not that far behind. He's like, let's just hope that the chain comes out. He's like, it's still connected. But totally. If it, but if it comes yeah. out and doesn't get wound up in his wheel, he's like, You'd be all right. There's not a lot of pedaling. I'm like, there's a giant <laughs> pedal motorway. It's called the motorway because you pedal so hard. <laughs> and so he gets all through that and through the S wood bridges, mm-hmm. the turns. I was like, my thought was I knew how good he was from that point mm-hmm. down on the track. And I was like, if he's in touch when he leaves those turns, I got a chance. And he was like 0.08 down or something like that. That's funny. I, I don't remember a lot of results, like numbers or qualifying results. I terrible memory. But I remember those splits. And mm-hmm. it was like 0.842 or something like that down. And I was like, within a second, I'm like, he can win this. Like, And the chain was out. And I'm like, he's so good from this point on. There's no pedaling. And he's so fast in this section. And he went by point. A four two point zero four two or something mm-hmm. like that. Nothing. I mean, just barely, yeah. and pulled it off. And it was like the three of us and the start, the starter, like at the top, and like you oh, just hear the wild. crowd down below, and it's just that's it. Like that's your celebration for a win or like that moment in time. It's crazy. But uh, yeah, and then we got down there, and nobody knew. Like even people down there it was like <laughs> until he lifted his bike. Like even Troy didn't know. You can hear him on the live mm-hmm. feed, and he's like, "Wait a minute." When did you lose your chain? He's like right out of the gate. And then you hear him drive. He goes, you mother effer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like right on the live feed. It was, it was good. Um, yeah. And then I didn't lose my job. <laughs> I still, I was just like, I was so quiet. I was like, I freaking, you better not make any more mistakes. Like your job is on the line. Still like, that's my, that was just my mindset. Nobody ever told me that my job was on my line, <laughs> on the line. Like nobody ever said it. I would have been fired. Just, my mentality i guess um yeah that's how that all went down that's awesome that's a great backstory yeah i'll probably like the other side. still get videos from that for the rest of, from for the rest of no I, re- I do remember yeah. it was like yeah. a week later and that video made it on a shock mansion and aaron sent onto like their website and then the instagram and everything aaron's like dude we made it <laughs> he was like Pumped. yeah this is this is yeah. making yeah. I, I wonder yeah, how many views that video success. has it, millions right that and yeah. the ex 471 video yeah <laughs> where up. yeah but i guess it would depend on where it's like who posted it uh-huh right yeah, like sure. on what channel yeah. obviously youtube but um like whatever page i know we're way over time and spammer's just like please please make it end but uh <laughs> too good spammer <laughs> You can't stop greatness. Before you go in there, that's the last litter mag Instagram post ever was Gwyn <laughs> dropping in an eagle grabbing him and flying him and dropping him down for the win. So no <laughs> way. I don't wanna I don't wanna burn any bridges, but that year at um uh World Champs, so full custom bikes, all this yeah. stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think Andorra. Yep. That yeah. year? Twenty fifteen. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. So we get there and specialized specialized was making our yeah. seats. We were running specialized seats. 
and they made Aaron a custom seat. And the logo on the seat was an eagle flying with a broken chain in its talons. And then like a star for like, I don't remember if it was all of his wins or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like a little like circle. Some I was like, dude, this is so sick. And our team manager came over and was like, Hey, like we can't run that seat. I was like, what? Why? And he's like, it just, and if nobody from SRAM said anything, nobody said we can't run it. He's like, he just made a decision like, Hey, like it just wouldn't be a good look. The broken chain. The broken chain. He's like, it just wouldn't be a good look for our sponsors. And I was like, I can't disagree with that. Like you're right. But I have that seat still. Oh, I don't think anybody's cool. ever seen it. Like I saved that one. So I was like, well, can I at least keep it? Or he's like, yeah, it's yours. Oh, that's pretty sweet. Yeah. So I just wanted to, this is a great moment to make a disclaimer for anyone listening to not attempt this at home because I attempted to be Aaron Gwynn one time. You uh, practiced Shane, Shane Lissarons, didn't you? No, I didn't. Uh, it was big group ride. We would always do like me and all my idiot Seattle friends would do like a closing weekend in Whistler. Mm-hmm. trip and it was like 20 of us doing a pain train down a line like lower a line where it's a million miles an hour i broke a chain and i'm like fell out of aaron Gwynn's frame it's gonna fall out of mine <laughs> we're going like a million miles an hour and it like did the full saw blade thing into my thigh and oh. it literally yeah because it gets caught and like locks up your cassette yeah and then it's locked into your cassette right because it's wrapped around like a chain whip and so i had like a three foot chain whip <laughs> oh, into my thigh my God. but like that close to my scrotum oh, right no. like oh. unbelievably close to just uh castrating me and it literally <laughs> left like it was one of those things you, you know when you like have a rock at your shin or something and it hurts so bad and you're oh. like oh. I'm fine. I need to right? breathe. <laughs> breathe. Like, your face is turning red. Where you're it fine. hurts, but you're like, I'm going to ride this out. I pulled over immediately. It was just like, <sighs> I'm bleeding for sure. And I was bleeding. out of a zone that I cannot bleed from. <laughs> <laughs> and I pulled over and it was bleeding, but you could literally see like the individual chain link oh marks through the shorts. Wow. Yeah. That's normal. Entirely I was expecting like comfort. it went into your wheel, locked you up and you yeah. went yeah, on the bars was, yeah. in the face of a jump or something like that. But that's Didn't worse. It was, green whip. it was yeah. great. So oh. don't attempt this at home. No. <laughs> The old broken chain. I broke a chain in qualifying at MSA and qualified, and I was pretty proud of that. That's out of, amazing. Out of the gate, probably. I mean, probably because it was you know six months old. <laughs> Nico, so that's. I, I hate but, to keep it going, but that sparked a lot of debate on mm-hmm. whether it was more to efficient <laughs> to pedal or not pedal. Oh. We should test yeah. that. <laughs> so there is a, I and I don't know what it is. It's not. A, I'm not keeping it a secret, but um, there. There is a number out there. I forget what the speed is that it's more efficient to tuck than it is yeah. to paddle. The Nico Vuyo roll. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I forget what that speed is, but we had some cool technology that would alert a rider beep, beep, beep. when they were in that zone. That's super But cool. you couldn't huh. race with it. Like uh, we tested with it and it was mm-hmm. like, yeah, but it's sick. But it was like, you can't run it in a race. Like it's illegal. Mm-hmm. It's, you can't do that. So it was like, oh, that's good that was pretty cool out. stuff. Mm-hmm. Um and then that also sparked a lot of debate in bike development when mm-hmm. Aaron came down and he was like, that bike works pretty good without chain. Mm-hmm. That's and all I was thinking. And like, everybody we went, thing working the way we want finally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he was, and everybody was like, Hmm, really? Mm-hmm. And then it was like, well, how much force or like how much of an effect does a chain have well, on a suspension system? And then it was like, wow, it really does. The year after Kenyon had that free hub disengagement lever on their bike, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like pull the paws out and just kind of do like what an O chain does. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and then like, G-Aptin. yeah, the missing gear yeah. in the cassette, mm-hmm. like, and everybody yeah. started going down it. Trendsetters. I just run. <laughs> Did you say that? Austin just... Innovators. Oh, I thought yeah, you said so... trendsetters, like yeah. at the exact same time. <laughs> oh, I thought like, like, exactly. wow. I just run loose chain ring bolts. That's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that okay? Just... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cheapo. Size too small. Just perfectly fine. Cheapo chain. Yeah. No, if you just run your chain so that it has sag in it, and so it takes yeah, a while for it to tension up, it's just exactly it's the same. Too. <laughs> it's slightly louder. Chain protection's needed. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> and if you've made it this far, you are a champion and need another hobby. This might be a two-parter. <laughs> no. Bomer no says, He's, no way. That is, yeah. min- says that, that is all, minimal post. All or nothing. <laughs> Bomber says, this All is my deep don't end. Don't be boring. Oh, wait, I got switch. <laughs> All or nothing, don't be boring. 
Swomer says, this is my deep end. I will stay here all night. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> this is my deep end. <laughs> You're just oh. swimming in it. Wow. My hammy quad. It, uh, kind of cramped up though from sitting here for so long so <laughs> have you have you mentioned anything about socal speed team uh that was charlie's it? opening question for his inside line is what is socal speed team and did he throw it down i can't wait for it to come out yeah he definitely described it well and he hinted at the future there's did a you future... want to plug it <laughs> yeah well no well absolutely but yeah there's a future socal speed team we're freaking pumped Maybe, although Charlie, I think, is really fascinated. On... I have no idea what it is. It sounds like multi-level marketing. Like, there's this exciting new opportunity, and you have the chance to get in at the ground floor. You want to buy now because you can have the speed team under you. But you also are like, do you guys know it's a joke? Or is it supposed to be a joke? And like, I was is that like, the worst name on purpose or by accident, right? Like, that's the best name on purpose. Team Awesome Fast. <laughs> No, we're uh, yeah, we're gonna storm the world. <laughs> yeah. But you can't get in now if you would like. Where are you Ground from? level. Where do you live now? <laughs> yeah. That will determine if you can be part of SoCal Speed Team. He actually just moved to LA, so Oh dude, you're in. You're in. <laughs> Holy. I'm on the team. You're on the team. I'm on the speed team. Uh, we have a East Coast contingent out there with uh, Nico. He said he's gonna start East Coast Speed Team though. <laughs> Dang. ECST. ECST. Where we battle. Mm-hmm. And we send out contingencies and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Big money on the line. <laughs> <laughs> so much, so much free marketing for SoCal Speed Team lately. Yeah, gonna have to Good. have the Speed I, Team on at some point. I love how Southern California hey. refers to the bottom quarter of California, but the East Coast refers to just anything the entire East, East Coast. Rockies, right? <laughs> but why does Florida refer to itself as the South? Because it definitely has a good chunk of East Coast, Coast. coastline. More than any other state. <laughs> More than any other state on the East Coast. But they're like, nah, we're South. Like, we're we, South. Don't count, we don't talk about that. <laughs> it's like the South and the Deep South. It's like there's two different. I'm like, can we mm-hmm. just have one? Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. The deep we do got to have the soak out the the whole speed team on. That'd be a long table. That would be really really entertaining. I'm going to be honest. That would be one of the funniest podcasts. It would take years to have happen part. just to get Kevin to show up at a given time. <laughs> yeah, but him and we could just and Brad trick Owen. him and tell him we're going to do our ride again. We that's true. And then say, hey, we're meeting and leaving from here. And be like, come on in, and be like, oh, weird. There's microphones in like a two to three hour window. <laughs> yeah. This an intervention? No, it's podcast. No, yeah, I <laughs> think it was an intervention. <laughs> oh, that uh, double this. I don't know. No, I don't know. Probably quite. I mean, you need Kevin sure. and Brad and you and JP, but then like Charlie and Nick and 100. percent I, I mean, it kind of keeps going. Well, I mean, honestly. if you, if we're going off of a roster, <laughs> it's big. If we're going off board members, we got five. <laughs> Yeah, we need faculty. We got five <laughs> board members. There's a SEST <laughs> board Charles members. <laughs> SEST board members group text. <laughs> and we're not in that, so I guess we're just members. You're on the team. Does now. does Phoenix count? Because Johnny's in Phoenix. But like, but you I'm don't really get from Northern California. Like, uh, now he's not counting. Yeah. That but is Tanner quite conflicting. Fifteen minutes away from me, so that's a big question. That is true. Tanner just like <laughs> Tanner decided to work remote now, down here, and now he's so. Yeah, I mean, I get it. He lives yeah, he's, here now. He's just down here now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm definitely not down here. You have a I'm Giants blessed. hat on. You are definitely not SoCal. Speed Tanner wears an A's hat. That's a very good point. Yeah. I mean, I that, normally wear an A's hat. I just found some. That's the second time today that got brought up. What? Tanner wears an A's hat. The A's hat. Like, what team are you on, dude? I feel like I don't even. One hundred percent. I was like, I don't know what the beef is with all these baseball teams, but apparently, it's just a hat. Yeah, but I think a Giants hat in Dodger territory is very different than like if you're wearing an Oakland A's hat. It's like it's gonna be okay, buddy. (laughs) Hang in there. Just (laughs) hold my. I'm I'm so out of pocket on this. I I know nothing about. Screw the Giants, and I'm just like, oh. My bad, and I literally put this hat in my closet in high school. And I found it like last week, and I was yeah. like, "Oh, I need a new hat. We'll, we'll rock that." For and those, I still think about the guy. It's like, dude, I can't believe you'd wear a Giants hat. I'm just like, we're adults now. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, For those of our listeners in Europe, we're talking about baseball. By the way, yeah, yeah. baseball. But America's pastime. <laughs> it's about as much as I know about that. Other than um, when but, yeah, if you had not said baseball, I would have no idea though. what these teams you were talking about. You moved to Southern California, you're on the team. Yeah, so... Like, not just anyone, but, I mean, you gotta have some... You'd be part of the contingency, for sure. Mm-hmm. 
What is that? SoCal Speed Team goes worldwide. It was my third time Yeah, so here. a little bit of background for you in the audience. So the Giants, the San Francisco <laughs> Giants. <laughs> yeah. we We've tried to this. end this we podcast this. an hour ago. Uh, uh, thanks, everyone, for watching. We have no idea when episode three will happen. Probably when we convince Spomer to come to SoCal again. Dude, I want to do this every week. Come on down, dude. I mean, if we get sponsors for this and then we, there's a budge, you know. We could be on PJUN. No time. Yeah, we could. T- what? So we are in at the ground level. <laughs> Potentially. That's Investors? True. Possibly you. <laughs> <laughs> That's, it. That's it. We're done. <laughs> A big shout out goes to Jensen USA, Max's Tires, for supporting the inside line. Welcome, mountain bikers.